I want to welcome everyone back to the Picanona show and um thank you. This is my thousandth episode. If you would have told me when I started this that I would have had an a thousandth episode, um, I would have told you that you were probably insane and I'd probably be dead by now or something. But um uh here I am. And um I invited my friend Thomas seven 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 to come on the show uh and do this with me. How you doing, Thomas? I'm very well, thank you. I'm honored to be here for the for the millenarian episode, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's no I'm, that's no small thing. A thousand episodes. That's a hell of a lot of content. That's a real milestone. And I mean, it's a milestone that it's New Year's Eve. This has been a really incredible year. I mean, everybody yeah. says that. I mean, it, I don't I don't mean that in a corny way. I mean, it really has. And I'm profoundly optimistic for 2024. So we're in a good place. I am I am as well. I'm very optimistic for 2024. I think if our people really concentrate on uh, getting things done, taking care of business this year, 2024 at the end, we're going to be much stronger for it. They will be much stronger for it too. I think there's a historical moment underway. Yeah, definitely. And I think I'm both old enough and I'm plugged in enough to the zeitgeist because I mean, that's frankly all I do is try and perceive these things. You know, um, I think I think I can I think I can read the proverbial proverbial tea leaves more adeptly than some men. So yeah, these are exciting times, man. And, um, yeah. It's good we're here on New Year's Eve, uh, producing content like the busy bees we are, and not and not 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 doing gross stuff for New Year's Eve, like like dodging puddles of vomit and and stepping over like weeping fat chicks <laughs> yeah, those those days are gone for me i, I yeah. like being i like being at home <laughs> being at home or being with friends so um um well what i wanted to um what i wanted to ask is well what i wanted to say is the reason i chose this to read is because it's something very different than what i normally read um a lot of this is poetry uh is very poetic i also think that I, i'm pretty sure this is probably the last thing that that um, Mr. DeGrell wrote. Uh, it seem, definitely seems like it's probably the last thing that he wrote that it really meant something to him. Um, I thought we'd open this up by, you know, tell us a little bit about what you know about Leon DeGrell. I mean, in the inner warriors, DeGrell was too young to have fought in the Great War. I think he was born in 1906. He was born in 05 or 06, like around there, okay? But he he came of age, he was very much marinated in the culture, the inner war years. And one of the things that's lacking in court history accounts, even ones that aren't particularly punitive in terms of casting Germany as being taken, swept up by a, a kind of cultural pathology that was both against precedent and and not really connected to the spirit of the age other than other than in a kind of contrarian way but there you know the the things that were ripping through germany you know very powerful intense energies of of a constructive and destructive nature this kind of confrontation with the future and with the the present which had all the trappings of a a kind of ominous future like this stuff was the stuff was impacting every every culture in Europe, okay, writ large. And I mean that's why, like we talked about in the Spanish War episodes, you know, there there was a truly on on, on the nationalist side of the fascist side, which you know is an incomplete characterization, which just for purposes of a shorthand description, I, I think that's at least adequate. You know, like we talked about, you know, there was um the funerals of Vasily Marin and Ion Mota, you know, these Romanian Iron Guard guys. And, you know, it was, uh, you know, Italians, German National Socialists, you know, Hungarians, um, you know, uh, Carlist types in, in Spain who supported the crown, you know, like all these, all the, all these anti-communist right-wing elements, you know, turned out to literally salute like their, this funeral procession. And similarly, the guys who staffed the ranks of, of these frontline, 
formations in the Spanish war. I mean, they, they were guys from all kinds of backgrounds and, you know, all, all the nations of Europe, quite literally. And, you know, they, the common bond was, you know, a belief in like, in, you know, in race, you know, like capital R, you know, like a, you know, faith in God, um, you know, a, a radically pious commitment to those things, you know, and in Belgium, there's a lot of high culture that comes from Belgium, you know, I mean, it's, it's not just, it's not just um, this kind of like accidental convergence uh, of of German or Dutch culture and and um, you know kind of like a francophone statelet. It uh it, it it really is a unique place. Like I've been there like many years ago. Um, you know, De Grel was a De Grel was a a Walloon. He's a Belgian, like a francophone Belgian. The right wing tendency there that he was actually instrumental in kind of creating. Um, it was very much, uh, I mean, it was it was the Rexist party, you know, it was, it was it was very much royalist, you know, in terms of its kind of in in, in terms of its kind of superficial trappings, but it 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 was very national socialist adjacent. Okay, um, it was very other than me Catholic and openly Catholic and royalist. Like it was, I'd say it was more adjacent to 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 the national socialist. Uh, culture um than any other and any other of the of the of the of the, of the, the lesser axis movements save maybe the the situation in croatia but that's basically the that that's a culture from from where de Grel emerged and um initially uh there's a walloon legion that was incorporated into the wehrmacht um the term legion was kind of loosely applied like i think uh it could mean anything from a force that was you know slightly larger than than, than that company you know um in uh in the u.s army or the british army of the day you know to something that was um you know the size of a like a, a battalion and a half you know um so it varied but the Wallen legion was it was it was comparatively small, but it was game enough, and it was um, it was populated enough by volunteers that, you know, the uh, it, it enjoyed the honor of being formally incorporated into the Wehrmacht. And then later, De Grel uh, proved himself uh, an incredible, an incredibly effective, like infantry combat commander. Okay, um, first at squad, and then platoon, and then you know, company level and beyond as a very young man. And ultimately, uh, the Wallen Legion became part of the Waffen-SS. And that was very much de Grel's, that was very much at his behest. De Grel believed in the Waffen-SS, okay? Um, and that's important. Like, it wasn't just, um, the reason why there was such the, there was a kind of, kind of like delicately and very and, and powerfully uh, evocative, uh, like the delicately crafted and the, and the kind of like the, the powerfully evocative in design heraldry of the Waffen SS, like that wasn't an accident. It wasn't just because it wasn't just because German um artists attached to the attached to the the officer schools were bored or something. Like the Waffen SS as an enterprise, it was a uh, it was supposed to be an enduring institution. It was supposed to represent the pan-European idea. And moving forward after NSIG, <clears throat> you know, there there was gonna be a there was going to be a European army. Okay. And um to what degree they would have butted heads um, with the Wehrmacht, um, that's hard to say, but operational integration on the Ost front was actually very tight. And um, there was there's a lot of mutual respect between the here and between the Waffen SS that developed. So I don't, I don't think it would have been another like night along night situation at all. But point being, um, you know, de Grel, uh, he wasn't just this kind of dreamy, you know, pan Europeanist who will say to be a war hero. Like he, you know, he, the culture of the Waffen SS, um, it was guys like him, it was guys like Joachim Piper and Kurt Panzermeyer. Um, it was uh, Paul Hauser, who was, a, who was an unsung military genius, in my opinion. And he was kind of the big, Hauser was kind of the big defector from the old uh, sort of army elite 
you know, who, I mean, he, he, he signed on for the VOF on S, SS immediately. And it's not like he was some, it's not like he was a guy, you know, who had problems like some of these early off and SS authors did like who were great combat commanders, but you know, they had a problem with womanizing or brawling or alcoholism or something like Hauser could have done anything he wanted, you know, but he, um, he believed in the Waffen SS, you know, like as, as a proposition and as an enterprise and to itself, that was essential to, you know, what was to become the new order. So the Grail kind of embodied all those things, you know, that's, that's why it's significant. And then he, he, um, he survived the war. Um, he quite literally crash landed in Franco, Spain as a wanted man. And he, he lived to be quite elderly. He lived until the 1990s, early nineties, if memory serves. I know he lived beyond 1988. Um, I think he was alive until like 93, 94. But, you know, he'd show up at IHR events and, and like mingle with people. And, you know, he he very much positioned himself as kind of a defender of the historical record. Um, he uh, he never shied from his war record, you know, up until the day he died. He'd, on uh, formal occasions, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd wear his like war decorations, you know, and... Uh, he was he was proud of the Waffen SS until the day he died. So he was he was a real man and a real patriot. And especially, you know, because my like my generation, our generation, we were kind of like the last generation of young people, you know, who were like around like World War II veterans, you know, um, I uh, in in appreciable numbers. And uh, DeGrell, I've talked to a lot of guys who got to meet DeGrell and stuff, you know. Um, Mostly European guys, but some, but some of the <laughs> some of the American dudes who were active, uh, you know, with in IHR and and with like Liberty Lobby stuff, you know, late eighties, early nineties, and they who had a chance to meet him, and they they just said he was like an incredible guy, you know, um, which I'm sure he was, but that's I mean that that's his significance, um, and this um that's something uh. I take up a peculiar interest in the Waffen SS, and as you know, and as the fellows know, as well as you know the even the casual subscribers, I'm not I'm not a military guy. Obviously, I'm not like prior service, and like I'm not I'm not some military science guy. I focus on the Waffen SS like I do, like not just because it's cool, which it is, and I I I don't I don't run from the fact that like, <laughs> gravity towards things just because they're cool sometimes. You know, I I don't think we ever outgrow that if we're intellectually curious. But it's also like the Waffen SS is a model of of European integration. I mean, that's essential, and that was after NSEG, That that was the model for how things were going to be organized. Okay, so these guys like Ian Ker Ian Kershaw and some of these other kind of just midwit court historians are like, oh, German chauvinism and German nationalism. It's like, look, nobody. There, there, there weren't a million like non-Germans who signed on to to fight in the Waffen SS because they loved the German nationalism. Like that's not how things work, and that's just not how it's asinine. Like in you know by the mid twentieth century, that kind of thinking was dead anyway. You know, like you had uh, the whole um, the entire raison d'etre of the Third Reich in geostrategic terms, and consequently in cultural terms, because the two things can't be extricated, was to make Europe a superpower. You know, so a um, this uh, this kind of like this armed like protection echelon and like Waffen Waffen Schutzstaffel, like it quite literally translates to like armed protection echelon or like armed like defensive echelon. You know, of um, kind of like replacing or as like a, a or a, or a representing um, you know, kind of a a, a vanguard formation against the. Uh, the enemies of Europe, like racial and otherwise, you know, kind of like a, a watch on the Rhine, like writ large, that was where like all all the nations of Europe were represented, um, <clears throat> you know, and with with heraldic uh, um, signification, you know, that that's something that dates to like Crusader era, you know, like that's that's very deep in the European kind of cultural, like military cultural mind. So it, it's important beyond the fact that it's just cool. You know, and that's why I was like very much not like a military type, like spend so much time with the Waffen SS because it's it's got an outsized importance in uh in the Third Reich and like the worldview that shaped it. But that's that that maybe that's probably a little bit outside the scope. But that's that's that that was that's important to consider if we're talking about Degrell 
in history and what he represented. Mm. All right. Well, this is, uh, I guess once we start reading this, people will get, people will get the notion that he's, uh, he's looking back upon his life and he's looking at not only what was, but what could have been. And, uh, there's a lot of that in there in here, but there's, uh, I think this is something that, that a lot of people should hear. So, um, <laughs> I'm going to share it and start reading. All right. There we go. All right. Uh, part one, empty hearts. One, the flame and the ashes. Stop me anytime, Thomas, to comment sure. on anything. Here I am nearly at the end of my life. I felt almost nothing. I felt almost everything, knew everything, more than anything I suffered. I saw, dazzled, the great golden fires of my youth arise. Their flames illuminated my, illuminated my land. The crowds made the starry waves of their thousands of faces dance around me. Their fervor, their eddies existed. But did they really, in fact, exist? Wasn't all this a dream? Did I not dream that 30 years ago a nation called my name and that on certain days that the most, the most distant newspapers of the planet repeated it? Tucked away in my exiled sadness, I can no longer believe in my past itself. Did I live those times or not? Know those passions? Raise those oceans? I walk my terraces. I lean over my roses. I discern the sense. Have I ever been another being other than this lonely dreamer who vainly clutches at memories frayed like mountain fogs? Wasn't all this something other than a hallucination? I cannot see far away, far away, in faded lights, their bodies, as if from a Greco painting, growing thinner and thinner. Do these men who have faded forever from the horizon know me? Did they follow me? Did I lead them? Did I exist? In my memories, as in my hands, I no longer feel that fleeting wind. My eyes, and what eyes should I have? Eyes of desperation? My eyes have searched the impassive sky, tried to see in the depths of the years, in the depths of the centuries, what did it mean? The being that I am, in what way it is still the being that once carried my name, who was known, who was listened to, for whom many have lived and for whom also many have died. This being, what, do, this being, what does it have to do with the man who walks bitter, endlessly alone, upon a few meters of, of foreign land, rummaging through his past, losing himself in it, no longer believing in it, wondering if it is really who he who was tossed a hundred times in the tornadoes of an implacable destiny, or if this was no more than a dream. So if I doubt my flesh, my bones, what my public action once forged, if I doubt the reality of my past and the part that I took in a few years of building up the history of men, what can I still believe of the ideals which were born in me, which burned me, which I projected, of the value of my convictions at the time, of my feelings, of what I thought of humanity, what I dreamed of creating for her? Each human being is a succession of human beings as dissimilar from each other as the, passer by, as the passers by whose disparate faces we scrutinize in the street. At 50, how do we still look like the young man of 20 whom we are trying to remember and whose survival we want at all costs? Even his flesh is no longer the same flesh. It is gone, has been remade, renewed. No more than a millimeter of skin is the skin of those times. You know, for context too, it um like DeGrell just mentioned that he's 50 here. Um and 30 years past the war, he's like in his 50s. And around that, Yakim Piper died um when he was about 60. But it the degree to which um I mean just pol politics aside, um you know, it had to be very, very strange beyond, um, I mean, it's it's strange. If you, anyone who gets caught up in historical circumstances as a, as a very young man and that kind of settled in a normalcy, I mean, that's strange. But particularly like Piper, you know, Piper went on to a, a, a prestigious job like with Porsche. Like, you know, he was like an incredibly successful guy by like any metric. But he, during like the last interview he gave to Spiegel when he kind of become a marked man again, during the kind of resurgence in anti-fascist um, 
um, tendencies. You know, he was like, you know, when I was, you know, when I was in, when I was in my twenties, I was, uh, I was leading a tank across the step against the red army, you know, and we, we were prepared to go all the way to Moscow, crush it and literally shake the world, you know? Um, and then, uh, you know, like nothing, like like nothing later in life is going to come close to that, and everything else is going to seem just kind of like mundane. But it's also these guys felt like prisoners. I mean, not just the, because of like the the kind of you know the constant um, the constant threat, like physical and spiritual, of um, the regime that replaced uh, the one that they fought on behalf of. But you know, everybody was hostage to the Cold War at this time, and particularly like in Europe. And Piper made that point too, like when the Spiegel guy was trying to kind of like impeach his, his not, you know, not, it, it kind of impeach his moral credibility. Piper's like, well, you know, now we're the designated battleground of, of World War Three. Like we're, we're better off now, you know, it, um, like basically saying like the existence we as Europeans live now is crushing the mundane, punctuated only by like the periodic terror of, you know, um, a crisis that can resolve in, 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 in a nuclear apocalypse. You know, it's, I mean, aside from the gravity of those things, that's, it's a very strange place to be, you know? Um, and yeah, in DeGrell's case, um, you know, he personally, he was personally decorated by Hitler. <clears throat> he was a, he was a Knight's cross holder. You know, he was a, he was a hero of the third Reich. Um, you know, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't just a, a run-of-the-mill kind of war hero looking back on on his glory days or whatever, you know, and to, to go from that to in a few years, um, you know, kind of having to watch where you travel because, you know, you might be, you might, you might be, you might be assaulted and, and detained and, and find yourself, you know, indicted in some kangaroo court in, in The Hague or Tel Aviv. Or the United States. I mean, that 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 had to be almost kind of surreal. Like I think about like those old TV shows, like The Prisoner or something. You know, like the old BBC show or whatever. It just um, I it, it, that's a very strange way to live. And like anybody who's at all thoughtful or psychologically sensitive, as obviously DeGrell was, that had to really do a number on him. But that's that's all I want to do insinuate. Good. What then about the soul and our thoughts? the feelings that propelled us to action and the feelings that passed to us like breaths of fire through the heart. How many distinct men do we carry with us who fight, who contradict each other or who even ignore each other? We are good and we are evil. We are both the objection, the objection and the dream. We are both tangled in inextricable nets, but it is not here that the horror of fate lies. The atrocious thing is to break these nets themselves, to throw your soul overboard. The horrible thing is to have to say that the essential in our lives was caricatured, disfigured by a thousand defilements and a thousand denials. Who has not experienced these debacles? Some realize their bankruptcy with pain. Others make the observation with cynicism or with an arrogant smile of those who no longer listen, who are convinced that the knowledge of man and the superiority of the spirit consist in engaging in all experiences, deliberately exhausting the most perverse pleasures without excessive astonishment and without regret, having found in the use and in the desecration of everything, information, the condescension and indifference of an ethics of decomposition, free from any spiritual counterbalance. Without a doubt, the world in which we live has become, to a great extent, the world of these amoral people, so sure of themselves. No doubt those who would persist in imagining a humanity of high virtues may fancy them to be anachronistic beings, non-evolved, glued to old fads, living apart from men, apart from their time, apart from fashion, apart from reality. And that's was, the Catholic to grow, like the Catholic game comes out a lot. You know, like it's obvious, like a non-Catholic national socialist wouldn't write this way. I mean, there's nothing, I'm not putting shade on 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 his tone at all. Quite the contrary. But it's it's interesting because, you know, the grow the, the Catholic and the national socialist, 
uh, coexist very in a very complementary and seamless way. And like that, the the people who are ignorant of the topic yet love to mouth off about it are always claiming like that's not possible or that's somehow contradictory. But he's um he's very much speaking as a Catholic through much of this memoir. Yeah, that's all. It was here that I arrived. I had dreamed of a se- I had dreamed of a century of knights, strong and noble, all dominating. Hard and pure, my banners said. I feel unbalanced with my bundle of old dreams. I know that feelings like the ones I have tried to express can hardly be felt anymore or even seem painful to some. But I have seen so much. I have suffered so much that one more bitter thought will not tire me beyond my ability. So too bad. These dreams, well, yes, I had them. These impulses, yes, I carried them. This love of others, yes, it burned me. It consumed me. I wanted to see in man a heart to love, to excite, to raise, a soul which, even if it was half asphyxiated by the pestilence of its slavery, aspired to find a pure breath and sometimes only waited for a word or a look to emerge and to be reborn. Let us be straightforward. The right to interject, to use others, the right to moral or spiritual consideration, these I do not have. I know this only too well. I have had my share of miseries, alas, like so many others, and even if I hadn't suffered them myself, I'd been, I've been loaned so many miseries from others that I can only feel, when I an- analyze myself, confusion and unfathomable sadness. Yet the spirit of the ideal that throws its fire into this book has devoured me every day of my existence. I should, of course, have left it to others, less affected, the care and responsibility of returning light and song to mankind, but that fire was burning me down. Today, suffocated by a relentless spell, the great fire of yesteryear leaves nothing but ashes. I come back to it anyway, stubbornly, because these ashes evoke the moment of fervor in my life, the deepest impulses, the very spiritual basis of my action. Here they are, disarrayed, delivered to the wind, which will quickly disperse them. These thoughts, these dreams are all in disorder. I have not made a plan. It is the height. I did not sit at my table like a distinguished and reasonable writer. I have not written a manual of the idealist, chapter by chapter, calculating everything, measuring everything. Not that, nothing like that. What to do? The impulses of the soul are not graduated like the flow of a gas appliance. Hope, passion, love, faith, pain, and shame dictated to me the writings that I tossed about at such and such a time because I felt them then with great force. Sometimes it was at the summit of my public action. Sometimes it was in the abandonment, the mud, and the cold of my distant life as a suffering soldier in the vastness of the Eastern Front. But the soul that lived these impulses followed a common thread, invisible to many. It was nevertheless the artery that spiritually nourished my existence. Therefore, these notes are not so much nonsense. They record the ups and downs of a soul among souls, all of which have their ups and downs. Certainly the spirit which has arrived at the stale wisdom of cynicism can dominate by its cold smile, can display the icy marble of its interior tomb and engrave on them its findings with an impassive pen. But fire, it has many forms. It rises, lowers, is reborn, starts anew. This book is fire, with the exaltations of fire, the excess of fire. If only they could have the (laughs) beneficent heat. If only the souls could find this comfort and vigor as we find them meditating in the evening near a large, almost silent wood fire, the waves of its powerful life penetrate in their radiation and their contemplation. They offer themselves completely. They deliver themselves completely. The gift, the real gift is thus, annihilating until the last brand. For me, my fire is dead. My life has plunged into the abyss, has been submerged by the black dawn that has smothered everything. But I still want to believe that these impulses which animated the action of a man already dead in the eyes of most, though he has the misfortune to still live for himself, will still be able to join spiritually from here to there in the world, anxious hearts. I remember these words that I had deciphered one day on a tomb of black marble there in Dom in Flanders in a church of my lost homeland at Seymour to a even dead, it burns. 
May these pages, the last fleeting fire of what I was, burn for a moment, warm for a moment, souls haunted by the passion of giving and believing, believing in spite of everything, in spite of the assurances of the corrupt and the cynics, despite the sad, bitter taste that leaves us with the memory of our falls, the awareness of our misery, and the immense field of moral ruins of a world that is certain to have no more of salvation, which prides itself on it, and which nevertheless must be saved, must more than ever be saved. Yeah, and that's the you know, that's the point I'm always drawing a parallel between Crusader orders and the Waffen SS. That's not that's not just ex post facto romantic interpretations. And it's not just a you know, way of superficially drawing a parallel owing to the kind of multinational character. This is the like the degree to which I mean, for better or worse, and however anybody feels about the Third Reich and adjacent regimes and, you know, institutions like the Fafan SS, which were kind of like the tie that bound like these regimes together in terms of praxis, like the, these guys really did view themselves as, as crusaders and they, the, the imperatives that they were abiding were very much metaphysical and, and uncompromisingly moral ones, like not moral in the sense of, you know, what is morality, but, you know, Owing to uh, 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 their their worldview was populated by, you know, by by values directed things, you know, um, it was not um, it, it was it was not conventional kind of uh, um, twentieth century politics. Okay, um, I know that some people their rebuttal would be that well, this was a sort of like window dressing for, you know, typically crude power political activity and yeah there's always some degree of that but these institutions don't just spontaneously develop mythologies that substantiate you know the the needs of of like a war executive even a, even a messianic type person like Adolf Hitler that just doesn't happen okay this is obviously something that these men felt very deeply um in uh it was very extant in their in their minds and hearts, as it were, and that they can't be overstated. I mean, yeah, there was there was a there was there was a radicalism, obviously, that animated the communists to do what they did, and um, a kind of a a kind of reckless indifference to what the consequences would be, you know, if their revolutionary ambitions fell short or whatever. But it wasn't the same thing, you know. It it um, the place from where it emerged in emotional. In, in the most primitive kind of emotional terms, you know, might have been the same, but um, what it uh, what 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 it what in its what it, what its intentions were, and ultimately what populated that kind of worldview was like very very different, you know. And you um, it's not just a grill um, who makes these points, you know. Like I said, like if you read. What Piper wrote. I mean, even guys like Sepp Dietrich, who was, uh, you know, very much kind of a like a like a like a rough Hukun Bavarian. You know, like he 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 talked about, you know, his role as a commanding Liebstandard in basically like religious terms. You know, and that's that's um that's very authentic. Like whether you believe that it's right or not, that's not what we're talking about. Like we're talking about what animated. You know the men who actually um, took up arms in the service of these institutions and and the and the idea that uh, these institutions um, um, were were um, you know created to serve. All right, onward to the agony of the century. Love, why, why love? Human beings have barricaded themselves behind their selfishness and pleasure. Virtue has abandoned its natural song. We laugh at our old rights. Souls suffocate. Perhaps they were already liquidated. The evidence hidden behind the decorum of habits and conventions. Happiness has become, for man and for a woman, a heap of fruit, which they devour in a hurry, or in which they plant their teeth without more, and reject them pell-mell, damaged bodies, damaged souls, quick exhausted by the fleeting frenzy already looking for other more exciting or more perverse fruits. 
The air is charged with all moral and spiritual denials. The lungs draw in vain for a breath of fresh air, the freshness of a spray thrown close to the sands. Man's interior gardens have lost their colors and their bird song. Love itself is no longer given. And besides, what is love? The most beautiful word in the world, reduced to the rank of physical pastime, instinctive and interchangeable. The only happiness lays in the gift, the only happiness that consoles, that intoxicates like the full fragrance of the fruits and leaves of autumn. Happiness only exists in the gift, the complete gift. His selflessness gives him the flavor of eternity. He returns to the lips of the soul with an intangible sweetness. Give, to have seen eyes that shine, to have been understood, touched, fulfilled. Give, feel the grand, happy tablecloths floating like dancing water on a heart suddenly adorned with sun. Give, to have reached the secret fibers that weave the mystery of sensibility, the mysteries of sensibility. Give, to have this gesture which unburdens the hand which relieves its carnal weight, which exhausts the need to be loved. Then the heart becomes as light as pollen. Its pleasure rises like the song of the nightingale, a burning voice that lights the darkness. We pour forth with joy. We have emptied this power of happiness, which was not to be partaken self selfishly, which encumbered us, which we had to pour out in the same way that the earth cannot endlessly contain the life of springs and lets them burst under crocuses and daffodils or in the fa fault of the green rocks. But today, in a thousand withered wells, the springs of life have ceased to flow. The earth no longer pours out this gift which swelled it. She holds back her happiness. She chokes. The agony of our time lies here. The century does not fail for lack of material support. Never before has the universe been so rich, filled with so much comfort, helped by such productive industrialization. Never have there been so many resources or goods offered. It is the heart of a man, and this alone, which is bankrupt. It is by a lack of love, it is by a failure of believing and of giving oneself that the world has overwhelmed itself with murderous blows. The century wanted to be no more than the century of appetites. This century wanted to be no more than the century of appetites. Its pride was wasted. It believed in miracles, stocks, and ingots over which it would be the master. It believed just as much in the victory of carnal passions projected beyond all limits in the liberation of the most diverse forms of enjoyment, constantly multiplied, always more degraded and degrading, endowed with a technique which is, after all, generally only an accumulation without great imagination of rather impoverished vices of emptied beings. From this important, um, that, well, you know, the um, even people who are critical of, you know, the the fascist regimes and of and of the Third Reich, you know, people like Julius Evola and to a uh, some degree Rene Guillon, you know, they acknowledge that what was significant about these movements was that there was an ambition for something um transcendental that's was fundamentally lacking in not just opposing ideologies, but in adjacent ones too. And I mean, everybody, everybody who's, um, I mean, everybody who's at all practically minded realizes there's limitations to politics. I mean, as there should be, you know, you don't, you don't swap out religious piety for politics and you don't, you don't decide that, you know, um, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't decide that, you know, there's a political path to the cultural renewal or something on its own terms. But um, there, it's not an accident that there's not really, you don't, you don't, you don't find, you don't find communists and you don't find guys who, uh, you don't, you don't find Tories in the UK um, from the epoch who are like writing and talking this way. You know, the fact is, um, it's like Nud Hampson said, um, Hampson, uh, you know, he, he got the, Nobel Prize for literature, and then he, he essentially like eulogized Adolf Hitler, and that made a bunch of people really mad. But he, um, you know, um, Celine made the same point, you know, that there was a that um, this was you know Europe's historical moment um, to try and redeem something of a 
of cultural life by way of um, political mechanisms. Like, however, however misguided it may have been in terms of, um, you know, an, um, an improper uh, instrument instrumentality being employed to that effect. But that's why, that's why, it's, that's why it's laughable when people are like, oh, you know, the right is uneducated. It's like, what, 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 what do educated people talk about? You know, like labor and capital paradigms and like what, what people are doing with their genitals. I mean, that's, that's what educated people are into. Like it's, it's I mean, it's laughable, but, um, you know, DeGrell, obviously DeGrell is an outlier in the sense of, you know, he was a, he, he was a remarkable guy, both, you know, as, um, as a, as an infantry commander, as well as a, like a man of letters and stuff. But, um, it wasn't, um, it wasn't remarkable that, you know, these are the kind of like, this was the kind of like passion that animated his commitments, you know, um, and that, that's important to, uh, consider that's all. From his conquests or more precisely from his mistakes than from his falls. I put my camera off for just a minute. Don't be alarmed. I'm still here. No problem. I just gotta fix my contact lens, but go ahead. No problem. From his conquests, or more precisely, from his mistakes, then from his falls, man acquired pleasures that seemed supremely exciting at first, and which were, in fact, only poison, filth, and falsehood. For this falsehood, this filth, and this poison, however, the man and the woman had abandoned, had desecrated, through their dreams and their devastated bodies, inner joy, true joy, the great son of true joy. The puffs of pleasure from possessions, matter of flesh, must, being illusory and compounding in their flaws, sooner or later vanish. What remains is only the passion for taking, seizing, in bouts of anger that set them against all obstacles and against the stale orders of decay clinging to their ransacked and rotten lives. Vain, emptied, their hands dangling, they do not even see the moment approaching when the artificial work of their time will collapse. It will collapse because it is contrary to the very laws of the heart and, let's say the big word, to the laws of God. He alone, so strong that we laughed at him, gave the world its balance, directed the passions, opened to us the gates of complete giving and authentic love, gave a meaning to our days, whatever our happiness and our misfortunes. We can gather all the con conferences of the world, gather by herds, the heads of state, the economic experts, and the champions of all the techniques. They will weigh, they will decree, but essentially they will fail because they will ignore the obvious. The disease of the century is not in the body. The body is sick because the soul is sick. This is what is essential, whatever it may take to cure. The real, the great revolution to be made is there, spiritual revolution or the ruin of the century. The salvation of the world is in the will of souls who believe. Part three, part, section three here is the right path. Those who hesitate in the face of struggle are those whose souls are numb. A grand ideal always gives you the strength to overcome the body, to suffer from fatigue, from hunger, from cold. What matters sleepless nights, overwhelming toil, stress, or poverty? The main thing is to have at the bottom of your heart a great force which warms and which pushes forward, which revives the loose nerves, which makes the tired blood beat with great blows, which puts in the eyes that fire which burns and which conquers. Then suffering is of no consequence. The pain itself becomes joy because it is a means of enhancing one's legacy, of purifying one's sacrifice. Ease sedates the ideal. Nothing writes it better than the whip of hard life. It makes us understand the depth of the duties to be assumed, the mission of which we must be worthy. The rest does not count. Health does not matter. We are not on earth to eat on time, to sleep on time, to live a hundred years or more. All this is vain and foolish. Only one thing matters, having a useful life, sharpening your soul, improving it at all times, monitoring your weaknesses and exalting your impulses, serving others, throwing happiness and tenderness around you, giving your arm to your neighbor to rise all by, to rise all by helping each other. Once these duties are accomplished, what does it mean to die at the age of 30 or 100 years, to feel the fever throbbing at the hours when the human beast cries out at the end of its power? Let him get up again, despite everything. 
the ideal appears to give its strength only at the breaking point. Only the soul counts and must dominate everything else. Short or long, life is only redeemed if we have no cause for shame at the moment we have to give it back. When the sweetness of the day is calls to us and the joy of loving and the beauty of a face, a perfect body, a light sky, and the call of distant races, when we are close to giving in to the lips, to the colors, to this light, to the number, to the numbness of the relaxed hours, let us tighten in our hearts all these dreams on the verge of the golden escape. The true escape is to quit our dear, is to quit our dear sensitive prey at the very moment when the sweet scent invites our bodies to fail. At this hour, when you must abandon softness and place love above desire, when everything is painful to the point of cruelty, a sacrifice really begins to be whole, to be pure. Then we have surpassed ourselves. We are finally giving something. Before we looked only to ourselves, and the concern for pride and selfish glory corrupted what flows out from our souls, and it was used instead of given. One gives for good, without calculation, because all is given, and nothing remains of the giver. Only when one kills the love of the self, this does not come easily, because the human beast is reluctant. We understand so poorly what can be learned from bitterness. It is sweet to dream of an ideal and to build it in your mind. Still, to tell the truth, this is precious little. What is an ideal if it is just a game or a sweet dream? You have to build it, after all, in reality. Each stone must be torn from our comfort, from our joys, from our rest, from our heart. When despite everything, the building rises over the years, when you do not stop along the way, when faced with heavier and heavier stones to be placed, you continue, only then does the ideal begin to live. It lives only to the extent that we die to ourselves. What a drama, deep down, that righteous life. Yeah, it's heavy stuff. and. It's also just more generally, not simply related to the epoch in from which, you know, de Grel emerged and things. Um, that's um De Maestra makes those points too, that there's not there's not this like there's there's not this, you know, intractable tension between, you know, men of action and and um people prone to asceticism. You know, like the latter are the ones who who bleed quite literally to bring those things into reality you know and i mean it's i mean plus too i mean that that those two functions were literally combined you know in the knightly orders that served the roman church you know i mean i i realize that can be overstated too because it's not that was a discreet epoch as well you know it's not like the final statement on soldiering or on or on piety or whatever but you know this idea that um this this idea that these things are are fundamentally at loggerheads and like irreconcilable it's this nonsense you know and it's not people people draw upon um like the birth of tragedy and the genealogy of morals as well as like beyond good and evil like nietzsche to like try and flesh out their conceptual biases it's not what nietzsche is talking about um it's far more conceptually nuanced um and uh, his notion is basically that these it's a self-defeating enterprise because salvation comes in the form of repudiating that which it sets out to confirm. I mean, that's like outside the scope of what we're discussing now, but I, um, people, uh, people have this like very, very like literalist and like rigid idea of you know, oh, like the the soldier or the partisan is at odds with, you know, the priest or the or the religious person. Like that's not the case at all. Like not only is that not the case, but they're they're essentially one and the same. And unless you understand that, you're not gonna understand, you know, like how how politics as we know it developed in the West. If we're talking about if by politics we mean, you know, not I'm not talking about the day-to-day -day business about like this the village council figures out, you know, how to keep the water running. Like I'm talking about, you know, um, I'm talking about um, these con how conceptual horizons develop, you know, um, and how um, these things come to, you know, how these things come to um, embody like prime symbols of 
of cultural reference and things, you know, um, and that's, um, in, in that regard, you know, the, the Third Reich and, um, the Waffen SS and the various fascist movements and, and these, uh, these difficult to, def you know, categorize movements like the Iron Guard, like on the one hand, there was not a lot of precedent for that because, um, the, the historical conditions that created those tendencies hadn't existed before. But at the same time, the like the the underlying kind of impulse that gave rise to those movements, like within the minds of uh, of the men who created them, like that's something that that that's something that's not that that's something that's well well known to the Indo-European mind. And I'd argue it, it it's so ancient as to be primordial. You know, um, yeah, that's Excellent. that's heavy stuff. Excellent. Yeah. All right, we're going to start getting into some heavy stuff here because it's going to start getting real personal. Yeah. Uh, part two, Wellsprings of Life, the land of our birth, part four. As men, we belong always to a people, a land, a history. We may not know it. We can try to forget it, but events eternally return us to these sources of life. They bring us back first to the men of our blood, shameful or bright, family binds us together, ever tighter and firmer with time. It can even be suffocating. We never get rid of it. Where our blood is concerned, we are bound to it. Blood comes always before reason. We are one with these ties as if our veins were only one organism and the family had only one heart, a heart that pumps the same blood in each of us and reminds us of our vital hearth. The same is true of our homeland. We cannot escape it. The sight of a yellowed print of our cathedrals, the memory of the smell of the dunes, or the gray hue of our hillsides, of the curve of our rivers, brings up to our throat a love that stifles us, that makes our voices hoarse. The country's past is embodied, is embedded in the depth of our consciousness and our sensibilities. Everything about us is survival, rebirth, even if unconsciously. The past of a country is reborn in each generation as spring returns, always in new sprouts. We may be unburdened, traverse the world, lose our mind. The native soil, soil still sends into our hearts an essence that we do not create and that dominates us. All that it takes is the voice of a radio station picked up in a distant country, brought by imprecise waves, so that memories, ties, and laws emerge again, real watermarks, indestructibly embedded in the fabric of our tormented days. Part five, Hearth and Stone. You must have won wandered over the most distant seas, known the red nights of the tropics, the cane fires, the songs of the Negroes, the deserts with their pink sands, their leafless shrubs, the skeletons of horses bleached by the winds. You must have climbed frozen lakes and hot snow, picked mimosa flowers from the ruins of Carthage, grapefruits in Havana, a blade of grass near the fluted pillars of the Acropolis, to fully love your homeland, that which we first saw with the only lucid eyes in the world, the eyes of a child. It is necessary to have known other journeys with furniture and clothes, books, tables, the simple material goods. It is necessary to have been this nomad of the anonymous apartments where one sits as one sits in a train to know the passion and the nostalgia of, first of, of the first of all landscapes of this place in the heart that is home. We can speak without regret of the great joys of foreign lands. They still gild our eyes. The day rises The day rises yellow and silver on the palm trees which skirt the Sea of the Antilles, clouds of fog in the olive trees of the Delphi Valley, fishermen rowing in the clear blue nights of the, the Cyclades, the palm grove streaked with sun, red, uh, sun near the red walls of the Marrakesh. But the memory of wandering journeys in the prisons of our soulless lodging weighs us down and suffocates us. What remains in our life of the, these impersonal relays? The walls where we heartlessly hung and removed the paintings? The apartment next door where you were surveilled? The mingled chatter of telephones? The staircase where we met without knowing each other? The cell car of the elevator with its double bars? We look at this decor of life and death with dull eyes, charged with veritable despair. 
What do these partitions tell us? The kitchen opened to a horrible courtyard a few meters long without an unexpected nook, without a quirk, without a barren of natural foliage, without a cozy nest. What say these beds and furniture, always awkward and embarrassed, as if they feel out of place, poor, unhappy, vaguely nomadic? Even furniture has a soul. The old sideboard that clutters the corridor, the clock case that no longer resonates so as not to annoy anyone, once lived, once knew a real house, had for a hundred years, two hundred years, their place, their touch, their scent. Poor sideboard and poor clock. Far from the polished parquet, from the smell of lavender, the worn and water-stained staircase, the conversation all about it, the salute of the sun entering suddenly through an open door. We alienated moderns, dragged from apartment to apartment in soulless cities, feel a little more torn from our hearts each time we have to cross a new threshold, light up the sterile white corridors, get used to these handles, these shutters, this door that does not hold, this gas stove that flares up too quickly, these buses that pass by with awful horns that crush the soul. We are silent, but we forget nothing. Yeah, it's very, it's very much Heidegger. I'm sorry? Is that very much Heidegger? Yeah. Yeah. And man, like the old sideboard and the big clock, motionless, looks and sees. The land of our birth returns to life in our memories. Here it is. A little foliage lights up the facade. Two blue stone steps. A large vine encumbered balcony in the gardens. Everything is in its place. Everything has a meaning, a smell, a form. We go to the cupboard. The cupboard, that beautiful, full, serious word, because it holds our nourishing bread. So familiar, we can navigate it with our eyes closed. This corner smells of tobacco. That one, the cat, who always purred in the warmest place. That noise is father rising from the office chair. The halting footstep is mother, who, in the dining room, waters her flowers. These rooms are not merely places to stop. This one is the room above the living room. This one is the room above the office. This one is the room of the little ones, even when they have become men with heavy thoughts. Each of these rooms has its history, has known its vigils, its maladies. We left it one morning carrying a darling body in our arms. Ah, the horror of our children being born or dying in anonymous apartments, surrounded by living furnishings since departed, where other nomads have, in their turn, resume their awkward life without soulful memories, not even daring to remember, so out of place are they. House of yesteryear with your poor draperies, your occasional bad taste, that ball, this ball on the railing, these photos of children in a Lulu, the grand piano, the black fireplace, the tin bathtub where people washed one after the other, these steps that we still scale 20 years later in memories, the breaths that we hear again passing close to us, the face of the mother who appears, first in the distance, then right there before our eyes, almost inscrutable, we feel like children, desiring again her soft caress. Calls of immense tenderness rise with distant sense of flowers and foliage, Songs of water pass at the bottom of the garden, the soft sunshine filling our entire world. Everything we are comes from that time. Unfortunate are children who have never had a house of their own and who do not collect these memories from which our life flows. It is the home that forms us into who we are. How can we have a soul in a faceless house, one that is changed like a carnival mask? Life is fixed on hearth and stone. The rest flows away like broken wood floating on, on a winter stream. Home, our tender fortress. It takes on a unique face little by little, built over time through common hardships and the birth of children. The walls hold love and dreams. Its furnishings, beautiful or ugly, are our companions and witnesses. A sweetness rises slowly from the souls within. It becomes a place of contemplation, rest, and certainty, rather than a brief stop on the journey of our existence. Softness, balance, points of reference, testimony, self-examination. Without mother and home, tell me, my soul, where would we be? Is this him you know, always talking about um, living historically? It's kind of hard to live historically when you live a nomadic life. No, exactly. And it also, 
you know, epigenetic memory is, um, you know, what, what, what is accrued, um, during people's lifetimes, um, there's no reason to believe that that's not passed on at the biological level, in addition to, you know, simple cultural learning and things, you know, um, when we talk about a way of life, we're quite, this is quite literally what we're talking about, you know, um, and that kind of like linear natal experience of, um, of the culture. So, um, not only is it disruptive, um, obviously, you know, if, if there, if there's literally no rootedness to anybody's life and, you know, not only every generation who, you know, does, a does the does does the family like up and 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 moves you know to totally strange environs but even like within people's lives like in the present epoch it's you're it's supposed to be normal for you to just you know um radically alter your surroundings and your pattern of life in day-to-day -day terms you know multiple times and that's that's crazy um i mean obviously that doesn't lend itself to psychic uh, or spiritual stability but it also it makes it basically impossible to sustain any kind of um any kind of cultural learning over time but i mean that's 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 the point you know and the what consciousness is that's a huge question but um one of the you know one of the reasons heidegger remains relevant is because he was fundamentally fundamentally concerned with the question of consciousness um you know we we can't talk about culture um as a, a as an intergenerational experience without discussing consciousness and the and the degree to which it is actually like literally transmitted okay um i know that's a controversial subject but um nobody would deny that basic postulate and to deliberately aim to eradicate that process you're basically murdering cultures like you're basically destroying people's ability, not just within their own discrete, like individual life to like, you know, drive meaning um, and uh, to participate historically, like within their life. You're essentially like removing their ability to to constitute, you know, a component of um, of 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 an enduring cultural enterprise or phenomenon, and that's that's um that that that's an incredibly evil thing to do. You know, um, and I think people detect that even if they don't have the knowledge base or the sort of conceptual signifiers to coherently identify what's underway. Um, I believe that is one of the reasons why so many people are, in comparative terms, revolting against um you know the the global regime because they're realizing what it's trying to do to them i mean not just them personally but like what it's trying to do to people um and 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 kind of re retool the human condition it is something that you know basically doesn't doesn't just render individual lives meaningless but you know like murders cultures which means that uh you know it's basically basically erasing people's entire peoples from history as if they never existed um that's like that's like committing homicide times a million but um that's probably a bit outside the scope but i it's fundamental to understand that what i just described um to understand where de is coming from i mean that's the core of what um national socialism was aiming to address as well as you know the rexist movement that he found himself um at the helm of as as well as any number of other movements that constituted the uh the resistance to the um you know to the uh capitalist bolshevik paradigm part six the breath of life Men can debase themselves. They can live in increasingly frenetic agitation as millions of madmen engorge themselves. Yet the nobility of motherhood preserves pers uh, preserves among thousands of natural and vibrant hearts its own pale radiance. 
Today, the maternal essence moves just as it did in the days when the first woman felt their bodies stirred by its indescribable thrills. From that hour, women are no longer the same. Yesterday, they were hurried, their eyes clear, their souls empty, their lips distracted. The, new, the life born in them, like a hidden flowering, suddenly gives them gravity, confidence, a great and proud force, the certainty of creating, of giving, and the emotional charm of the living mystery that will one day be born through their pain. They remain mirthful, but their gaze becomes deeper. They carry within them a treasure whose pulse is intimately linked to their own, their vigor, their melancholy, their gr this great ideal, sometimes undeclared, which lifts or torments them, thoughts and regrets, joys and desires become one with this hidden life, ever present for the one who gives it blood, gives its blood and soul in this perfect communion of flesh and heart. They are brave and weary. Tired of the overburdened body of their youth, bent like branches, laden, he laden heavy with fruit, weary of sun and wind, yet still valiant, knowing what their renewal, knowing what renewal their bodies now tenderly contain in this flesh that their most delicate tremors shape. They know that this flower soul, barely open in the night, will bloom tomorrow. The innocent heart which they cover like the cover like the night sky is filled with sweetness and peace of the stars and the silence. Among the clamorous world, they carry this glimmering night. Their dreamy eyes contemplate these great moonlit landscapes where a world known only to them lies dormant, powerful, and immense. They see blue mountains, black and smooth waters, enchanted skies studded with fires set in the jet black of evening like ethereal gems. They advance under the, these nocturnal lights, the heart taut but unsure. No one walks beside them. The universe looks elsewhere. They alone watch. They alone have the eyes to see it. They go on, body heavy, soul tense and elevated, as if drawn by the greatness of this secret night. These months when the flesh blossoms are their private springtime, when only the, shadow, the shadows and the scents, the colors and the lights reach their great love, stretched out with arms open to life, like an orchard of the heart. They will experience the birth of this new life, sundered from the great dream. They are, then are faced with constant efforts in the service of their, these bodies and these souls, which enchant them and which frighten them. Royalty, trembling, and radiant. What will be reborn in these hearts? Will they keep the song and purity of mountain waters? Will these naive eyes ever make you cry? Will this little curly head, the color of the sun on the stone wall, carry good and clear thoughts, the mother's dream, like fiery sword lilies? It is best not to fear too much, to show the straight course, but to leave it lined with greenery and woodlands, and to let them travel pure and bright, the earthen past, uh, the earthen, the earthen path of the horizon. The mother will put in the hearts of the little ones once again only what she will have nourished herself. Their soul will contain what hers will have contained. The images of her heart will trace great reflections on them, like shadows advancing in the fields under the white clouds of the great summer sky. She can only bear their gaze if her soul is as clear as theirs. All that is not flesh and pure astonishes children and leaves a mark on their hearts. They will not later have strength and renunciation, wisdom and simplicity, virtue and joy, unless their spiritual nourishment is as pure as mother's milk. The faces of mothers are noble, supremely clear, rejuvenated by the presence of willfully innocent lives, even though a thousand, even through a thousand days of hardship. Women are greatly blessed by the body that trembles, turned towards their the inner dream, in which dwells the grand secret of the breath of life. Part seven, the task of happiness. The more we walk among false smiles, greedy or unclean eyes, grasping hands, withered bodies, the more we are disappointed by the mediocrity of existence. We quickly realize that only the joys put in our hearts when we were young remain solid and eternal. It is in youth that we are made happy or unhappy forever. If we had a calm childhood, soft as a big golden sky, if we learned to love and to give of ourselves, if we enjoyed when we were 
when we were very young, the enchantment that the sky and the light gave us at all times, nature always within our reach and always changing. If we were made with a simple heart, naive as the morning, human, sensitive, good, linked to real and natural affections, then life will remain for us until the end of our troubled days, like the sky arrayed powerful and clear over even the most treacherous roads. There is a task to happiness. We either develop it or suffocate it. If we train children simply in deep but elementary joys, they will advance in life by keeping in their eyes the light of their inner life, balanced, persevering. But if we ruin their childhood, if they have seen too much or heard too much, if they have caught wind, uh, caught, if they have been caught in a whirlwind, if years of calm tenderness have not strengthened in them the tender happiness of their innocence, then their life will be what their childhood was. Witnessing disorder, they will become disordered. Having never been made steady in their tastes, their feelings, their thoughts, they will be at the mercy of the winds, possessing only illusory joys that will burn them and, and immensurate that and immiserate them at the whims of others it becomes far more difficult to change later a hardened tree cannot be straightened one can at most clear the foliage and cut back branches but when it was young full of sap we could have straightened it with an agile finger guided it helped it to flourish it is at a time when children simply seem to be playing watching simply observing a sparrow or a lark spelling words and giving kisses that they photograph in their hearts, in their imagination, exactly that which we give them. Life is just the development of this photograph of this photography. The acids of existence will imprint on them the images, beautiful and powerful, or troubled and sad, which we have offered to their curious little eyes, to their clear hearts like sheets of shiny paper. What we deprive them of by our pride or our agitation or alas, by our passions, will be cruelly repaid to us in seeing them unstable, dissatisfied, the soul weakened, and ravaged by our own fault. You got anything on that? No, I mean, nothing. I, I think anything I, I, I'd I add as addendum would kind of take away from what I suggested a moment ago, not because what I said was so profound, but because it would um you know detract from the kind of core yeah message yeah i mean that's um we should get more into without going too far outside the scope we should get more into um you know the era in which de Grel was looking back you know um mm -hmm. 60s 70s 80s and the implications therein and that's also when you know i mean heidegger's last public statement in the form of like an interview was 1965. um mm -hmm. and then there was um but i mean i this 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 stuff all the kind of enduring perspective of of um dissident traditionalists you know the capital t or unreconstructed national socialist and fascist of the era um and uh the degree to which that became like a truly underground tendency which now is somewhat emergent in ways that was not possible before but i mean this is all important stuff it's not just you know a conversation starter about you know why oh why is the girl interesting to read today you know it it relates to the origins of um, the movement that de Grel served and why the stakes became so truly desperate um, when Europe was threatened existentially by the, the kind of twin hydra of um, Sovietism and, 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 and Americanism. But uh, yeah, I, uh, I'll be more. I'll be more with it too. In this, when we reconvene, I'm, I'm getting over another flare up. Um, but I, but I'm but well. Uh, if it's not gonna screw up what you want to accomplish, we'll um, we'll deep dive a little bit into um, you know, um, the Heidegger and and kind of the Aristotelian aspects of National Socialism that also dovetail with 
Catholic um, metaphysics, if that's agreeable to you. Okay. Uh, well, part three, we're gonna. I'm gonna finish up Christmas time right here. And then we're gonna take a break, and um, and then when we come back for part three, part three is the misery of mankind. Um, it may starting off uh, with what you want to talk about would probably be a very be a good introduction to that. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. All right, about another page and a half. Part eight, Christmas time. We were only little children from the Ardennes. The snow blanketed the horizon, piled above the eaves of the roofs, and packed itself tight into the bottom of the bottoms of our shoes. We were sure we saw St. Joseph turn around the corner of the Rue de Malone. To climb the way to the church was tough going in the midnight darkness. At the last deep slope, we resorted to carrying our shoes in our hands. Suddenly, the night of frozen darts gave way to the warm smell of the dazzling knaves. Our heads were spinning a bit. The smell of the incense intoxicated. The doyen himself was pale. But from behind the choir screen came a din powerful enough to drive away the wild boars 10 kilometers from our tangled woods. The organ blower pedaled as if he feared arriving late. The director brought, to the, choir, brought the choir to a wild turbulence. By the time of midnight Christians, the emotion and the noise had been such that we were climbing atop the straw of the chairs, expecting to see the angels suddenly appear above the choir. But the angels had continued to stand quietly among the candles, with their large wings at rest. We approached them, hands clasped under our big woolen gloves. We were kneeling on the marble. The brown ox and the gray donkey were close by. We were burning to touch them, to see if their hair would part like a fountain of water. But we, but we children loved our children even more than we loved animals. We loved other children even more than we loved animals. Jesus was lying on the straw. It softened our hearts to think he must be cold. Nobody had given him thick stockings like us. No shoes. No scarf to wrap around his nose. No green woolen gloves to cover his hands. We looked a little astonished as the Father St. Joseph, who humbly stood, doing nothing to, gl to glorify himself, and the mother clad in blue and white, so still and so beautiful. We knew only beautiful mothers with pure eyes in which we saw everything. We had looked into those eyes so often, but those of the mother of little Jesus enchanted, uh, enchanted us to the extreme, as if heaven allowed children to see more in them than men did. We said nothing when going down to the coast. When children say nothing, it is because they have they, because they much to say. At home, the smoky chocolate and the big table covered with cakes never managed to tear us away on the return from invisible conversations between the children of human mothers and the little child of the mother of heaven. On the top of the piano, a, a crib had been erected where we could, standing atop a stool, take the ox and the donkey in our hands. Little pink and blue candles were lit every night. Each child had their own, on which they would blow a deep breath at the end of the prayers. Behind, kneeling near a chair, in the dark, the mother led our religious impulses, guided us. When it was all over, when we turned to her in order to obtain the right to put out our little lights, we saw in her two eyes, shining so much emotional fervor. Paradise comes into the hearts of children through the, examples, through the example of the mother. At that hour, humble and poignant, the mother knew that little souls had been marked forever that we could blow out the little candles near the manger, but they would never be extinguished in our hearts. Every winter, when Christmas returns, the little flames lit by our mothers once again burn high and bright. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great uh, Christmas statement, man. Yeah. Um, very timely. And I realize Christmas has passed us, but um, on New Year's Eve, uh, I, I consider it kind of part of the same ongoing event you know, between Christmas and New Year's. Um, so yeah, that very timely and very, very uh, inspiring stuff. Very edifying yeah. as well. Yeah, I, um, still saying Merry Christmas to people. I don't care. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. I, well, it's like I said the other day too, like even where I, I mean, I obviously like don't give a fuck about abiding regime convention but it's like what 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 other holiday is on december 25th like is there like i don't know about that's like a competitor holiday you know it's um uh, yeah great. i you know um yeah 
yeah no that's uh really uh really beautiful stuff man and All thanks right. um again sorry i'm i'm uh i'm dragging a little bit um but i i hope uh i hope people got something out of my commentary on this episode all right, we're going to continue to part three in The Burning Souls by DeGrell. But um, Thomas, you want to talk a little bit about the um, about the thought and about the basically what would have been guys like him at the time he's writing this, uh, what would have been their thoughts, especially looking back upon the war? There's a context that's not appropriately addressed when we're talking about national socialism and fascism and adjacent movements as a political philosophy. Ironically, some of the only people I know who've addressed that correctly were Leo Strauss and um, Joseph Cropsey. When both were at the University of Chicago, they published this huge volume, just a, a history of political philosophy. And I highly recommend it. Like it's not Strauss, it's not Strauss's it. own kind of I have it on the shelf over there. Okay, great. It's great. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's not Strauss's own. I mean, gen I don't generally recommend Strauss to anybody unless they're trying to I uh, kind of uh, trace the trajectory of you know the American right post Nuremberg. But as as an intellectual historian, he's very useful. And the book I mentioned, it's it's very it's it's very straightforward and it's very much correct. It's, there's not there's not polemic in it and it's not it's not colored by you know a stain of, of the author's ideological biases um but other than that there's, there's just not a, and carl loweth too who obviously in my opinion strauss was inspired by but who he parted ways with on on, on fundamental issues not just of ethics but on uh, you know ontological ones about kind of the history of, of european thought but um you know, there's this idea that, and it, it it transcends too, just like rationalizations for for dismissing any merits of of um of the movements that animated the countries that constitute the Axis powers. It goes beyond just the you know the, the kind of pragmatic affair of of, of discrediting them. It, people honestly believe that these things are just emergent as some kind of stopgap measure to to either prevent revolutionary communism or to you know from from dominating the political landscape or to rationalize what amounted to a power grab by a, a coterie of extremists who, who, who only had a loosely defined set of grievances as, uh, as their kind of political ambitions. That's not true at all. Um, and in fact, there was the, the inner warriors, the, the right, whether we're talking about, you know, the fascist, um, the fascist movement around Mussolini, whether we're talking about the National Socialist movement post Drexler, whether we're talking about um, you know the Romanian Iron Guard, all, all these movements uh, attracted a disproportionate amount of intellectuals, you know, like middle class intellectual types, you know, the kinds of people who spent a lot of time with political philosophy and with things abstracted from the kind of day-to-day -day business of, of politics. And that's one of the things that within their, their own dialogue with themselves and with each other, they, they were aware of that and lamented that this tended to be harmful to praxis. Okay. But if you want to really understand where the rubber meets the road, I, you've kind of got to read Heidegger and you kind of have to look at these things through an Aristotelian lens um, through a 20th century continental perspective, okay? And this can't be overstated. And, like, generally, like, I wouldn't bring this up in a discussion or a reading of a war memoir, but Leon de Grel is so very much in that tradition that I don't think it's something that can be overlooked. And um, and it also, too, I think Heidegger, some will disagree with me, including, I'm sure, some of the guys who, who follow Bronze Age pervert. I'm not, this is not, like, a slam on him or anything or or, or the people I'm discussing, but they seem to view Heidegger as like as as somebody who sort of like broke with Nietzsche and like was was some kind of like neo scholastic that's very misguided and it's incorrect. And what Heidegger clarified too, like what Nietzsche's objection was to Christianity and like why it was problematic. And it's not it's not 
it's not because Christianity is purportedly like pacifist or because it's Semitic or like anything like that. There's nothing to do with it at all. The the Heideggerian view and thus what became the, the the national socialist view, and I'm not saying they're synonymous. I'm saying they share this kind of uh, ontological view or, or view of like political and and philosophical and ontology in common. Is that uh like the beginning of the West um, as like a cultural form? You know, it uh, it it began with it began with the pre-Socratics, um, and it began with the question of being. You know, like what it is to literally be conscious and to exist in the world. Um, there was an understanding of this as being essentially as as being a, as characterized by a certain dynamism. <clears throat> and a tendency towards change and reconstitution and creative destruction. Okay. Um, I try to condense it as much as possible, but um, this, uh, this understanding of being was, was superseded by the emergence of Plato and Platonism, which of course too informs in indispensable ways, you know, the Christ, Christian metaphysics, regardless of your sect. Okay. Um, being is characterized through the lens of Platonism is an eternal presence. It's absolutely unchanging. Um, it's accessible by coming to know, if you want to look at it this way, like a realm of, uh, of perfect existence that can only be accessed by a difficult dialectical ascent. Now, human beings can't experience it directly, obviously, in the Christian view, you know, in mortal life. But the only way they can even come to understand it at all is basically through a combination of grace and piety, like the former which depending on your interpretation and confessional heritage and soteriology therein, like it's, it's exclusively like in the hands of God. But um, the crisis of the modern age to people like Heidegger and those two fascists and national socialists is that what modernity did was it created conditions whereby people could no longer believe in God. Like, not that they'd be punished if they did or something. What I mean is that just by being in the world as it existed in the modern age, and as a scientific and technological perspective crowded out all other possible ways of knowing, it simply wasn't possible to believe in this in 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 this perfect, immutable um, the form of being that that was God. Okay, like even if when set about to believe in it, you know, they, they, they it'd be, it'd be a, it'd be a dead on arrival as a proposition. Cause like, what would you do? Would you, would you mathematically calculate God? Would you, um, would you identify, you know, the essential characteristics of God and then attempt to access those things discreetly. And then, you know, through some kind of like discourse of a learned man, like come to know God, you know, like, obviously I'm being obtuse on purpose, but the, it's, it's, it's essential to understand we're not talking about some like deliberate turn towards atheism as we think of atheism today. We're talking about a, a literal impossibility of holding a belief in God as understood, um, you know, from uh, from very, very ancient, um, a very, very ancient epoch into the present. Okay. Um the problem with this is that if you look at the way people exist politically, again, in the view of Heidegger, um, in the view really of Aristotle, um, as a, you know, accounting for the, you know, kind of modern conditions and uh, the limitations therein, as well as, you know, possibilities that, that weren't in, in the classical world. Um, what being is, it's inextricably related to time and tempor temporal experience. 
that's how the human mind structures itself in individual persons as well as within cultures in races any kind of human organization writ large socially and politically i mean to like literally what your ethnos is is like the experience of a people and their being over time and the way that that develops is this kind of immediate consciousness in the mind of any man and woman that they are in the world that someday they will die that others around them are like them in some way and the language they speak you know the the physical artifacts they're attracted to you know the things they hold to be sacred the things they hold to be profane you know uh what they consider beautiful what they consider ugly you know what what they identify with in in intimate capacities and what repels them similarly in intimate capacities that's related to quite literally the experience of a people over time that can be said to be their people um, in the past, in the future, and in the present until that person or those people die. Okay. Um, this is the only way one can say, be said to experience being in the world in some capacity other than an animal. Okay. Because this is the only thing that is facilitates the production of culture. The grave danger of not just the modern age, but specifically the 20th century, is that the twin kind of hydras of communism and Americanism, Heidegger spoke of Americanism when he meant what we'd probably say is capitalism. That's not him like trashing Pecker Woods or saying Americans are the most awful people ever, so don't get upset. And that's actually accurate. What he is, it's more accurate to say Americanism than capitalism. But he said that the, the enterprise, the whole raison d'etre of these ideologies is to utterly eradicate the ability of people to exist in time and live historically. It's to totally eradicate culture so that there's no potential of any kind of identitarian existence. So that there's no human existence as we've thought of it heretofore. And instead we can replace culture with the things that really matter in terms of eliminating inequities and in managing people in in um in in secular life you know and that is you know mastering technology to bring nature within you know a productive domain you know so that we can do away with shortages so we can do away with you know um inequalities of status and and, and power owing to the fact that you know productive technique can avail everything in our environment um you know to 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 and avail it to being marshaled as a, a consumable resource okay so, so you're talking about a world literally devouring itself for the sake of keeping humans alive for the sake of keeping them alive you know um you're literally eradicating the ability of man to exist temporally you know um and that's a monstrous enterprise and when you add in the understanding of the human being as not just inheriting his culture in some loose metaphysical way, but in a very direct and biological way, as you know, is becoming clear is one part of the equation in terms of epigenetic memory. That's one of the fascinating aspects of the Human Genome Project, among many. And I'm not saying that biological process takes precedent over anything else at all, but I'm saying that the fact of this the discovery of these such things further confirms what we already knew, okay? Um, and that is, I, I realize that that wasn't short what I just kind of laid out there, but as a condensed, that's the condensed version of why the right became so radical and what its enterprise was and why it's somewhat difficult to define, okay? Like if you ask like what the communist program was, um, there was a certain complexity inherent because there's a certain complexity here to economics, even if your economic schema is not really founded upon falsifiable premises, but is 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 basically just you know like an ideological statement. You're still drawing upon um, tremendous volumes of of data, okay? That is you know within the terms of its own processes and assumptions is complicated, okay? If you're talking about Americanism, if Americanism is um. <laughs> You know the capital L liberal tradition. I'm talking about in purely, purely in terms of political philosophy. You know, from Hobbes to uh, to Locke, you know, to Paine, and then to um, uh, 
you know, Adam Smith and things like that. Um, there, you know, there's, um, there is a certain complexity there despite its reductionism, but it's a complexity that can be pretty, but, but it can be, uh, you know, described in, in terms of very concrete variables and phenomena. Okay. Um, if you were a fascist or a national socialist, or today, if you're, you know, a capital T traditionalist or a dissident, um, wherever you fall in the equation, you know, whether you're, um, you know, whether you're a, you know, whether you're a, a, a national socialist in the 21st century sense, you know, like I'd say I am in large part, whether you're a capital E traditionalist, you know, whether you're, um, whether, whether, whether your view of things, um, is, is kind of like that of guys who, you know, um, serve in Hezbollah or on the other side of the divide, you know, um, are, uh, you know, serve with these like Mujahideen, um, groupings on, on the Sunni side. Um, it's difficult. It's not as simple as saying, it's not just as simple as stating like, well, I just believe in my race or like, well, I, you know, I, I just, I believe in Christ or well, like I'm, I'm a Muslim or, you know, well, I believe in tradition and preserving, you know, tradition as an essential to culture and culture being an inextricable aspect of the human and the human experience and, and the human soul. You know, there's like, you're, you're talking about things of tremendous significance that also, um, you know, can't, can't, can't just be broken down into discrete sentences, you know? So that's, I know that people, the rebuttal is going to be like, well, you're just trying to myth mythologize something that's at base course and as simple as any other political, um, ontology. I don't think that's the case. Okay. Um, and I don't see how this is arguable. And that's when you're reading a guy like De Grel or Kadrianu or Francis Yaki, those three men came from very different places, okay? Um, had very different backgrounds. That's my whole point. The tie that binds is a commitment to this perspective that I just described in kind of um, the condensed version. Um, and uh, th these guys aren't just. Uh, they don't just love hearing them. So they didn't just love hearing themselves talk or, you know, they were, it's not like they were getting paid by the words. They decided to be as, you know, voluminous as possible. And it's not like these guys were, were literary figures who were trying to try to capture the perfect sentence or something. You know, it's because what they were dealing with, it wasn't reducible to the same concrete kind of schema of, uh, you know, a liberal Americanist or a, or a communist or these days, you know, like a secular humanist kind of statement of of rights or like of, you know, what constitutes the dignity of the person or what, you know, um, what we consider to be what we can consider to be, you know, due process in in terms of, um, you know, in, in, in terms of the modern state and, uh, you know, what the individual can expect um, in, in terms of. Uh, you know, his, his, his intrinsic claims to liberty as, as a good in itself being honored, you know, when confronted with the great power of that modern state. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll end now because I don't want to take up all the oxygen in the room, but I consider this to be very important, man. Like when we're discussing any of these, um, we're discussing this topic just in general terms, you know, approaching it philosophically and attempting to unpack like what constitutes its philosophical core but also specifically when you know any any discussion of any author in part you're going to be dealing with like not just the character of that author i mean when i say character i, I don't just mean moral behavior and stuff that's part of it but like what actual like what characteristics are most paramount in his personality but also you know like why 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 he configured his uh thoughts the way that he did in terms of trying to convey to others you know what what the what his experience of of uh of of life as a partisan was so that that's that's all i've got on that but yeah i wanted to get that out well i mean i, I think that's important because if you bring up the names like de Grel and yaki and um you know even heidegger but um who else did you mention there um i mean anyone basically from that um from that quadrant it's just dismissed as they were evil yeah, you know, they they were doing this just because they were evil men, and it's that's that's a real easy way to dismiss and to 
um, you know, just basically promote promote what the regime propaganda has been um, since then. And it's also just like grossly simple minded. Like I'm always making the point: if you're a per, if you're a guy like then or is now, like the grill or like Francis Yaki, or like Kodrianu, or like Johan von Leers, who's like different than all those guys, but, you know, I'm something of an Orientalist myself, so I, I take an interest in what he did. If you're somebody who, like, really takes an interest in race, you know, like, as uh, not just his own, and, you know, an interest in the posterity of his own people, but if you're truly interested in, like, race, if you're truly interested in politics, you're, truly, you're interested in race. And if you're interested in race, um, you know, you're interested in, in what its origins are, you're interested in its implications and you're interested in its nuances. So like, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to spend time around like other people's just because you want to observe them. And I do that all the time. And I've realized like every like major national socialist, like did that all the time. So like this idea of like, Oh, you know, fascists are guys who just like hate in words and like, that we refuse to live in, in like segregate, refuse to live in anything but the most segregated environments. I'm like, actually, they're like the opposite. Now you can say that like people like us like are looking down on people or like we're reducing people to, you know, these kinds of like non-human integers because we're curious about them. Like I don't accept that. You can like say that, but this idea of like that basically like a fascist or like a or like a contemporary partisan, you know, who holds, you know, similar sympathies adjusted for epoch. It's some guy who just, quote, hates people and wants to, like, live in some Mall of America environment where everybody's exactly like him. Like, that's not, that's really, really off base. That's, like, not at all, like, you're basically, that's some kind of caricature, that's some kind of combination of a caricature of, like, of, of kind of, like, a pussy Reagan Republican and, like, some weird communist. Like, that's, <laughs> like, that's not, <laughs> like, that's not, like, don't get me wrong. Like, it's not to say that people like me or people like us, we want some, like, multicultural environment around us because it gives us a chance, you know, to augment our research. But the point is that, you know, first of all, genuine multiculturalism is 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 very robust and rich when you're talking about exclusively like white people on deck, because there's many, many cultures that constitute our race. Okay, secondly, um it not what what I think what I approve of or don't approve of like politically really has nothing to do with like who I like or dislike. Like it's, it's in some ways it's the opposite, you know? I mean, the tragedy of power politics is that you may have to kill people individually or at scale who not only do you not have any problem with, but you might not even dislike, you know, like this idea that politics is just some sort of highly scaled expression of crude human passions of not particularly intelligent people who like don't like other people like that's that's oddly illiterate and like this is not the way humans act you know like uh like at all like like anywhere but yeah so it's like um you know it uh it's 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 really 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 fucking bizarre but it's also i mean even people again who have a somewhat more sophisticated take on it yet nonetheless you know erect an endless kind of army of straw men to try and tear down the right as an intellectual tendency like they like like they don't they don't get it either you know like the you can um you know you can say that uh you can say that people like heidegger were crazy i guess or you can say that well you know heidegger was just he he was afraid of what he was afraid of a process that translates approximately to practical transcendence you know and like oh for all of his talk about the pre-socratics you know, kind of like the immediate, the sen the sensuous presence, immediate presence of the human individually and at scale. You know, that's what makes culture. Um, for all for all this talk of dynamism and change, you know, he really was just kind of attached to like the state forms of the past. I think that's a gross and deliberate misreading of him, but like I'll accept that. But just saying that like this is all some like elaborate, this is all some sort of like elaborate charade. So that people can, you know, go around doing mean or evil things or so that, you know, they can rationalize the fact that they have some personal animosity towards like X, Y or Z group of people. Like that's literally retarded that that the suggestion that such things are are the motivations or, you know, constitute the commitments in the minds of the people who advocate such things or 
we suggest uh, that what I just described, um, you know, is a uh, is a matter of imperative significance to to anybody who um, you know wishes wishes for for human life to not deteriorate to the level of of beasts. But yeah, that, I don't again. I want I don't want to take up all of our time, so I will um I will um shut my mouth and let you get on with our reading. <laughs> Well, let us, uh, on that note, let's get to part three here, which is uh, the misery of mankind. I will start reading again, and like I said, stop anytime you wish to comment on it. Okay. So part, part nine, the blind men. The money, the honors, the mess of bodies, the eagerness to seize an earthly happiness which leaks between the fingers and always escapes, has made of the human herd a pitiful horde, ruining itself, tearing itself apart to find a liberation which does not exist. Only the false laughter rising from the rabble serves to remind us that it is not a question of herd animals, but of men. This stampede of the damned seized first the individual, then the people as a whole. It is no longer a solitary game in which one is enthralled by personal passions or vices. Whole communities are sucked in by the vertigo of impossible desires, the desire to be first, that is to say, the desire to trample upon, the desire for purely material power, that is to say, the desire to suffocate and destroy the spiritual. All willpower, all effort becomes useless in the face of this human dissolution, and it is here that the spiritual always reappears as a rebuke or as a curse. Yeah, I wanted to insinuate just, that's an important point, because as you do, whether you believe in the intrinsic value of Heimat or, or, or Gemenschaft, you know, blood and, like, you know, folk community or whatever, you know, when, when those things are taken away and all you have basically is, um, you know, it, 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 like, if, if something like, you know, um, if something like the Soviet system, like the you know, is realized as it was, you know, in the 1920s, and people basically like you, you, you do succeed, like you being, you know, the the revolutionary vanguard, you do actually succeed in transforming, you know, what was previously, you know, a community based on ethnos and and temporal being in the world or generations. If you just like reduce that to a labor camp, like people do start tearing each other apart because it's like, first of all, I got to look out for myself and my family. Like second of all, I want I, I want to be a chief, not an Indian, or at least you know like a shot caller, you know. So I'm I I'm, I'm going to attack whoever has more, whether it's clout or whether it's you know what passes for wealth, or whether it's proximity to you know the party apparatus. Like you're actually like you're you're actually encouraging people to you know to kind of tear out the root even further and kind of do your work for you. I mean, which is very much by design, in my opinion. That's not some kind of accident. But yeah, go ahead. Okay. This baseness has poured out from the limited circles of the elites into the extended circles of the masses, tossing them about on waves of infinite desire, ambition, and pseudo-pleasures, which are just character caricatures of joy. The clear water of the heart has been clouded to its outer limits. The river of men now carries a putrid stink. The disorder of the century has upset this river that was once light, reeds and plunging flights of swallows. Men and peoples regard each other with violent, with violent eyes, their hands seared and bitter by their avarice. Every day the world is more selfish and more brutal. This is great hatred between men, between classes, between peoples, between every, because everyone is bent on the pursuit of material goods which ultimately avail nothing. But all abandon the goods proffered to all of the moral universe and the eternity of the soul. We run madly, bloody our foreheads, beating our heads against the walls on paths of hatred or of objection, abjection, or of madness, shouting our passions, throwing ourselves wildly at everything, desiring to gain that which we can never have. Part 10, The Lines of Sorrow. There are few hearts that have not been soiled with villainy, sordid acts, leprous faults, leaving telltale cracks for those with eyes to see them. Even hearts washed of the stains of the moral swamp will still keep a bitter taste of imperfection and ashes. Cracked porcelain can be fixed, yet whoever saw it broken will forever recognize the lines, however finely repaired, of the break. 
he knows that the invisible unity of the perfect will never return, but it is gone forever. The longer one lives, the more the heart is marked by these lines of sorrow, imperceptible for all those who have not seen or not known what made them, but heartbreakingly by all they contain of de broken delicacy, like fine silks which run slightly, which runs silently. Happy again those are who, who are purified by invisible suffering. How many others, whatever value vice may have, strive to convince themselves that this abasement was useful, forever marked by this burning apparel which has cooled on their skin and sticks to it, corrupts their flesh, and becomes one with it? Whose eyes can one meet without trembling? What are they hiding? Who has not been vile on one day? Who does not carry within himself words, gestures, desires, shameful abdications, or the mummified corpse of his inner life? How many men, how many women do not even hide the bankruptcy of their senses, their oaths, and the miserable desecration of their bodies, sometimes with remorse, most of the time without remorse, or rather, even with a touch of triumph and insolent provocation? In the final account, those who have liquidated everything, decency, modesty, respect for oneself, for one's body, for one's word, and God with the rest, are only the results of hundreds of smaller prior denials, denied or hidden from the start. The whole is destroyed only when the innumerable fibers of the heart have been sheared one after the other by lies and ill intent, followed by multiple abandonments more and more ir irredeemable, ir irremediable, with the conscience assassinated at the end disaster. Decay saps the mind before, spending th before spreading throughout the whole body. The body does not yield, does not allow itself to be to, to debased, trapped, and defiled to death until long after the soul, negligent or intoxicated by the appeal of sin, has abandoned the oars, which at the beginning trace straight paths on pure waters. Part 11, the saints. Check on something here. Okay, good. All right. The saints, varying in intelligence but possessing a heart given without limits, whom the fallen and corrupt hold in such esteem, the saints show us the perfection is, that perfection is open to all. They too were simple men, simple women, charged with passions, weaknesses, and often faults. They too sometimes did to tire, give in, and tell themselves that they would never be able to get rid of the smell of muck and sin that accompanies us. But still, they did not renounce themselves. And that's important as vis-a-vis -vis what we were talking about or what I raised in the intro. Like about, if you're, look, <clears throat> if you're looking for like a fascist praxis, it borrows um, heavily from the understanding of, mar from the Roman church's understanding of martyrdom. Um, and, and for this reason, is what the grill just said. And that's, um, you know, the uh, getting... You know the this idea that like well you know we 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 one 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 can't come to know the eternal one can't come to know providence you know through through dialectic you know it's just it's just completely cut off and unavailable so you know how how, how can we how can we partake of you know what's essentially godly then you know it's like well you know through martyrdom that doesn't mean like running out looking for ways to kill ourselves or like running out and and becoming you know, holy warriors, all over some men that and some women too, that is their vocation. Um, martyr, as uh, our, our Roman Catholic friends will tell you, um, literally means witness, okay? Yeah. Um, and it doesn't mean that, I'm obviously not saying that fascist and national socialists somehow cornered the market on martyrdom um, in the contemporary age, nor even that, you know, um, Christian or Catholic concepts are intrinsic to, to national socialism or fascism. I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is that this concern with the uh, abandonment of God and, you know, the literal death of God by way of, uh, you know, the, 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 the triumph, the total and complete triumph of the, uh, of the rationalist and, 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 and scientific perspective, um, and uh, the destruction of the ability to live historically, um, you know, which, uh, and, and, and again, like living historically 
is simply the human being individually and at scale, you know, confronting death and thus like living in time. You know, um, the only way to reconstitute that is is through uh, is through is through the praxis of religion. You know, whether it's you know returning to Catholic uh, Catholic practice or whether it's um you know um discovering you know reawakening the inner witness if you're a protestant um or like awaiting you know the the conferring of grace you know through god's will awakening that inner witness or you know if you're like an agnostic national socialist which a lot of our comrades are and that's fine um nevertheless you know it's uh it's the, like the praxis of what we're talking about of reconstituting the sacred entails martyrdom um and that's hugely important go ahead okay they too sometimes did to tire give in and tell themselves that they would never be able to get rid of that smell of muck and sin that accompanies us but still they did not renounce themselves with each fall they straightened up determined to be all the more vigilant as their strength failed them Virtue is not a sudden dazzle, but a slow, hard, and sometimes very painful conquest. They had the superhuman joy of finally feeling victorious over their bodies and their thoughts. Their struggle tells us that happiness, on earth and beyond the earth, is within everyone's reach. Every one of us has a choice to make. Before the body fails, it is the spirit that triumphs or capitulates. And even when the body has given way, the spirit can lift it up or let it corrupt itself even more then poison itself forever. We are our own masters. We can sink into the, ch the chasms or stand in them up to the shoulder or climb out of them and overcome them. Everything can be avoided and everything can be done. Part 12, the, the eternal crucifixion. Faced with the contemptuous ironies of hedonists and skeptics, one hardly dare, dares to recall that for 2000 years, the greatest human drama that of the passion has been spiritually repeated each spring. Who will suffer? Who will be there near Calvary in these new days of, of agony? In the desert of time stands the cross. The mundane, shady, and perverse life of men flows on like a dull river. Christ will receive the blows and the thorns. He will collapse to the ground. The wood of the cross will cru crush, crush his flesh. The hammer will strike great blows against the hard beams. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. What will the world know? His blood will slowly come down on his pale body. His eyes will seek both his father and our souls. What will our souls understand about this tragedy? They have not shuddered or cried, nor even thought about it, nor seen. Christ moves well alone. Alone. The souls sleep or are sterile or have committed suicide while it is to pull them out of their torpor, mud, and death that this body hangs between heaven and earth in pain. The distress of this heart mainly launches a cry, launches a cry of despair which should freeze the earth and stop the breath of men. Yet it is because of man's spiritual suffocation that the world is falling apart. It is hope, charity, justice, humility that the world needs to find fresh air. We have received the spiritual life as a gift. We are the bearers, and our hands are dangling at our sides, and our eyes are dry, and our lips do not tremble in fervor and emotion. Our hearts are like dry sand. Our souls lay lifeless where they died. Faith is worth anything only as long as it conquers. Love as long as it burns. Charity as long as it saves. Part 13. Nobody. A palm tree trembles. The sand slides between the tanned fingers of a child. Lambs marked with blood coll collide with stubborn little foreheads. Tiny donkeys, eyes wet, come down from the hill. The Easter landscape clean and shiny. The air is still fresh. Daisies are scattered on the hillside. Why does Christ again suffer the most heartbreaking agony in these days when fans of mimosa flowers decorate the twisting roads? These clear, warm roads bring him back every year, silent and in agony, to the nails and thorns, to the blood and sputum. Lord, we are following you in your dusty procession, mingled with those rough and cowardly fishermen who loved you, but who loved you like us, with measure as if measure was not an insult to your love. We are like unto them, no worse than others, our eyes sometimes beaming with joy in serving you, 
We dismiss intruders. We wave the palms. We believe we are very close to your heart. We think ourselves better than we are. In your sad eyes, it is our vanity that we project. And in this hour of agony, because our love hung always by a thread, we will turn away from your wounds, your blood and sweat, and that great icy cry that will pierce the earth. Lord, we're coming back to your blued feet. We clasp this wood of the cross between our trembling arms. How dare we look up at your bloody head? We dare do nothing but extend our dismayed hearts to you. It would have been so sweet to give our souls to you in a complete act, to be with you from the Garden of Olives to this mound where you hang inert in the evening wind. We did not even have the fate of the penitent thief, the one who loved you last, who regarded you as he fell into heaven. We suffer the overwhelming force of our weaknesses, our cowardice, our tepidity. Our tepidity. Lord, you brought us to the essential and the eternal, the blood and the drink, the breath and the sun. You animated our hearts. You gave us strength. We should... We should have jumped, we should have jumped light with heart and celebration, freed forever from all bond, all regret, all other hope. Yet we remained fearful, hidden in the shadow of a doorway or under the bright olive tree. You went crushed and overwhelmed with insults. Ah, my God, in these minutes of pain and salvation, we have not grasped the cross. We have not kissed your wounds and your thorns, put to flight your put to flight your executioners, broken their whips, refuted their insults. We did not know how to love. At the moment of this complete giving, our hearts were lifeless. My God, there you are abandoned by all, silent and dismal, stiff-limbed. There was nobody, nobody. We squeeze the dead wood and depart without raising our heads, laying our defeated hearts at your feet. You will return to the light, Lord. At this hour, have mercy on the destroyed souls. Have mercy on empty souls. We suffer so much from our mean and vile sentiments, so imbued with ourselves, so preoccupied with our selfishness, our ambitions, our vanities. We let you suffer. We saw your blood flow. We saw your, we saw, we saw you plant your cross. Saw the life fade from your face. Will we ever dare to look upon your open wounds and to meet your weary eyes? Lord, the hour is near. Your light will suddenly burst forth upon the hill. We will still be there, ashamed and sad. Burn our hearts with your dazzling sweetness. Give us the warmth and purity of this divine fire from which you will spring. We are overwhelmed at the threshold of your tomb. Lord, make the spark of the resurrection bloom in our defeated souls. Yeah, see, this is it, this book is essentially, it's probably 90% Christian apologetics and, and, um, beatification of the martyrs by a layman and this is a this is like a Waffen SS officer you know who wrote this and again it um I mean I realized there was very much like a Catholic moment of a sort in in Francophone Europe underway which was de Grel's culture but it you know but this wasn't accidental and again you know de Grel wasn't some outlier you know the um the understanding of uh you know, martyrdom being uh, being um, the essential vocation of the racial patriot of the holy warrior, and you know the understanding of um, the understanding of the ability to live historically, being inextricably bound up to man's confrontation with death. You know, and and um, you know, religious faith you know, being the only way, not just a man comes to terms with that, but I mean, comes to understand it, you know, like that's really the only, like the, like the metaphysical discourse on man's relationship to death is, 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 is his religious confession. Okay. You know, and again, I, the girl wasn't, the girl wasn't just this kind of like random guy, you know, who ended up on the Eastern front or something. I mean, he had, um, he was a war hero. He had serious clout. He'd met Hitler personally, and like he was known to Hitler personally. You know, he um had NC been realized, he almost undoubtedly would have been um you know um one of the most powerful men in what was formerly Belgium. You know, what I mean, like he was he was a guy with serious clout. You know, within kind of the the greater the greater Reich. And um, and he's also like in a secondary sense too. It shows you how 
it shows you the degree to which, you know, what was animating the Third Reich was very much becoming a European movement. I mean, the seeds of that were always kind of present just going to geostrategic realities and, and kind of the shrinking of, um, of the world into kind of like one place as it were conceptually. But, you know, this idea that like, Oh, there was this, there was this, you know, chauvinistic kind of like backward looking nationalist party, you know, capital N nationalist party in the NSDAP, but, you know, just kind of out of military necessity, you know, the Waffen SS came about and some of these European guys, you know, decided they were going to get theirs too. And, you know, kind of forced acknowledgement of, of, um, of their own, you know, nations and government. So that's, that's not the case at all. You know, it's, um, you, you got to look at national social socialism as a European phenomenon. And you got to look at the specifically as, you know, like an exemplar of, you know, kind of the, the European Waffen SS, you know, as, um, as well as, uh, you know, Francophone fascism, but, you know, everything, um, everything, Every, everything, every, every testament this man ever put to paper was absolutely inundated with his Catholic faith, you know. Um, yeah, I just wanted to insinuate that. Perfect. Part nine, uh, or is, uh, yeah, uh, where am I at? Part, where is this? Thir that says part 14. Yeah, how do I, how, how have I forgotten in my old age to read Roman numerals? They can be Thanks. confusing, man. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. I appreciate it. Um, just think, just think of the Super Bowl. The, <laughs> that's the only. That, that's, time. that's what I think when I'm like, okay, now what is X symbol? Like? Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the only time anybody uses Roman numerals anymore. Is a freaking. And just saying, you know, it's like on the street of Sh in, in Sh Shy Town, like for ten dollars worth of drugs or a ten dollar bill, like street talk is still a saw buck because literally, like an X looks like a sawhorse. So like the last hundred years in the street, like a ten or ten dollars or, or like a little bit of drugs saw a book. It's like weirder that's endured. That's so I think. funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, this is the last part of part three, last section of part three. Uh, to have loved. In the icy, pale gold sky, a lark quivered. What was she thinking up there? She shuddered, she uttered strident cries, swooning Herbs. every <laughs> swooning every second clinging to the sky with a flutter of wings that passed like a lightning bolt she loved to love until broken broken with happiness she fell like a pebble in a furrow so does the soul soar she cries of love she remains she remains suspended in mystical immensity only by the wonder of invisible wings that support her she no longer even knows that she can fall that the ground is under her. She is there, detached from everything, trembling, pulsating, as if speaking. The lark swooning upon the warm earth must also feel, must also feel this great joy of fulfilled love. The soul is panting. Love returns in waves and breaks into effort, giving, and joy. The great tragedy of sin, which causes so much suffering, is that on account of it, we give less of ourselves or give badly, offering only a portion of what we might have a portion with hints of indelible defilement. To love is to give, and to give is to give everything. The punishment for falling is the pain of having trampled on your love, of having reduced the love you might have given. If only we could remove from our bodies, our hands, our eyes, these forces that pulsed in them at the hours of weakness and abjection. Too late, much to our chagrin. We may cry all the tears in the world, no matter what, we can never recover that which we so carelessly lost. The day of the fall, despite all our repentance and remission, will remain the black hole into which the good of the world is eternally lost. We may endeavor to love thereafter as ardently as we can, yet we will not create the lost, we will not recreate the lost purity, nor regain the most beautiful part of love which was annihilated. Our love could have been so much greater. What we yet possess to offer at the hour of the highest love will carry, whatever we do, this terrible mark. This is why having profaned his gift of self makes the heart which yearns for the absolute suffer until the end of life. We would like to be God ourselves, to take back this day or these times, to give them the freshness of dawn and to guard them fearfully until the night. From the first misstep, we know that we will no longer love as much as we could have. 
That is what makes repentance because it cannot repair a broken man. So heartbreaking. When we have known this pain of the irreparable, we seek beyond the possibilities of our heart so that a few moments of sublime love seized upon with great effort can compensate what fell in the swamps and in the shadows. Part four, the joy of men. Part 15, strong and hard. The sun is gone. In half an hour, it will be shade. The birds who sang madly in the gardens Bird. perceive it. <laughs> there are roses everywhere, so gorged with light that they will soon perish. The wood is already sleeping around a few tiled roofs. As always, the birds now begin to utter their sharp cries and their pleas, no doubt for the two lovers sitting there, dreamy, with a huge white hat lying across their knees. All of life seems condensed here. Nothing lives apart from these birds, this dog which barks at the end of the world, and that these two hearts which steadily beat in the evening calm, heavy with the vibration of June. How can one believe in hatred? Has one never seen the last roses go dim in the light evening silence? We will have to tear ourselves away from this great country oasis later. It will be necessary to take, again, at the end of the path, the road where the cars tear up the ground through a sputtering, relentless rain. There will be brutal lights, empty faces, soulless eyes. This evening landscape is so clear. It is given with such a complete generosity. These dying roses, these bouquets of trees, these oat fields shimmering in gray, these gray fir trees are so pure and so simple that a childlike wonder rises in our beings near this eternal youth of grasses, trees, and flowers. We cannot hear anything anymore. The night slicks down the roses. And then there's, he there's Heidegger and, and Heidegger's ontology like all over that, you know, the, the immediately present, the, the sensuous presence of the immediate, you know, human consciousness, you know, um, constituting what it, what it is to live, you know, historically or live, you know, as a European is as simple as, you know, what, what, um, what, um, the grill just described, you know, in that, in that passage. Hmm. The woods cut their jagged silhouette in the dying gleams. The last singing bird stops as if he too, from time to time, must simply listen to the silence. The two lovers have disappeared, hands trembling, a light wind in their hair. I should move on. I will go slowly without disturbing the branches and the variety of life which slides through the shadows. I will guess the outline of things. I will feel the dew blooming at the end of the grass, which will refresh the sun tomorrow when it climbs the top of the world top of the wood. Where is the night of hearts from which the tender morning would spring? We will have to renew our sorrows, resume our journeys through the fields and lost woods among cold hearts. Who will understand later in the savage glimmers before our trembling eyes that we have just left the forest and the wheat fields, the shade and the silence? But why falter? At the end of the path, we watch as cruel life snatches everything up in wolf's teeth. In wolf's teeth. We no longer look at anything, we no longer think, we no longer breathe the, this air charged with the sense of passing death. Put out the lights, let the night weigh upon our hearts. Tomorrow, when daybreak reaches the crest of the trees, we will have before us only the closed horizon of man. We will have to be strong and hard, joyful through nothing but the radiance of our souls. Dying evening, silent and sure of dawn, give us the peace of awaiting the light that is reborn renewed from the immense and auspicious night. 16, the price of life. We must reiterate the price of life. Life is the admirable instrument put in our hands with which we forge our wills, raise our conscience, consciences, and build a monument of reason and of heart. Life is not a form of sadness, but joy made flesh joy of being useful, joy of mastering what could demean or weaken us, joy of acting and giving, joy of loving all that trembles, spirit and matter, because everything under the impetus of a righteous life rises, lightens instead of weighing down. You have to love life. Sometimes in times of weariness and disgust, we nearly lose our love of life. You have to pull yourself together, straighten up. Too many men are debased. But alongside it, in opposition to those whose baseness is a blasphemy to life, there are all those who see or don't see, who redeem the world and bring honor to all life. 17. Despoliation. 
happiness born of ignorance is not flattering. It is a kind of narrow, vegetative happiness. Intelligence has nothing to do with it, and neither does the body. True happiness, happiness worthy of man, that which raises him up, is the happiness assured by the spirit. Happiness born by the stripping of the soul, from the renunciation of the soul, in contemplation of human pleasures, is always made or broken by circumstances. Happy is he who is not a slave to circumstances, he who knows how to enjoy pleasure as well as privation. As long as one suffers from such a deprivation, as long as one suffers from, by comparing his material fate to others, we are neither happy nor free. To remain in good spirits, even to live with one's soul apart from the world, when the exterior universe holds nothing but a yawning void, to live intensely in this material absence, to live without regret, master of your desires, having bent them to the complete domination of the spirit, marks the victory of man, the true, the only victory, next to which the greatest conquests and dominions are merely caricatures of power. Any comparison seems laughable next to the liberation brought by the mastery of the spirit over our possessions, our needs, and our chains. We are freed from the old rusty chains that riveted us to mediocre conformities. We hold destiny in our hands, destiny clearly discovered in its liberating nudity. Happiness can be born everywhere. It comes not from without, but from within us, holding within it infinite possibility. 18. The Power of Joy There are so many things that can bring you joy. Even when, through our strength, we are free of our desires, we are happy. Just the joy of living is itself so powerful. Joy of having a radiant heart. The joy of having a sturdy heart, arms and legs, hard as trees, lungs that draw life and air. Joy of having eyes that take on colors and shapes in their soft curves. Joy of thinking of spending hours drawing out the straight lines of reason or feasting on dreams. Joy of believing, joy of loving, of giving oneself, of striding through life, flexible as water. How can one be unhappy? It is so simple, so basic, so natural. Through the worst ca calamities, happiness always bursts forth like a geyser, which we try to obstruct in vain. Happiness and life are the same thing. To be no longer happy is to doubt one's body, the warmth of one's blood, the consuming fire of one's heart, to doubt these great lights of the spirit which bathe all of existence. Even misfortune still brings us the joys of the soul, which gives its own blood, which weighs out its sacrifice, which feels deeply, mis which feels deeply misfortune's bitter sting. A cruel joy, but a higher joy, a joy reserved for the man whose broken heart understands. And that's... I, I can't emphasize it enough if one's looking for something a little bit less remote to apply to their own circumstances. That's not to say that one should read political philosophy in order to discern, you know, prosaic, um, in order to discern remedies to comparatively prosaic problems. But there really, there is no such thing as a bad experience, a hundred percent. Like it's not, that's, that that's not, um, just a cliche or something that, you know, religious people pull out, to, you know, in the face of challenges to, you know, how one is supposed to negotiate horror and, and pain in, um, in everyday life. You know, I don't, I, I don't, I don't regret anything that's happened to me because it brought me to this point. And I mean, my life now is, incredible i never thought that where i'm at now would be possible and i'm just unbelievably blessed but you know i my life was horrible i mean for for years you know and um i don't i don't regret that like i learned more during that period and i came became firmer in my faith during that period than would have been possible otherwise and it also you know Owing to the proximity of death, because of the lifestyle I was living, it forced me to contemplate it in very immediate terms in a way that I otherwise probably would not have because I was quite a bit younger then. You know, and that just kind of whether you want to or not, you 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 develop a, a tendency towards contemplation of a, a theological principles. 
you know, unless you're truly like a dullard or something, like when you're within such circumstances. So, I mean, I can't emphasize enough that there's practical value in reading things like the grill. You're not just, you're, you're not just doing a credit to our forebears. If in fact, you know, you're, you're committed to these ideological principles like I am, you know, you're also, you're, you're also, um, you know, contributing to the strengthening of your own piety and faith by, by studying such things. That's all I wanted to say. All right. 19 to dream, to think. The hours of dreams are hours of profound life where all the poetry that floats in our consciousness gets up and runs in wisps. Then the sun comes. The snowy fog descends as if called down by the river. We see before us the bright, clear sword of water and reason reorders and assembles the, the scattered discoveries sprung from the dream, unifies them under its dominion. Joy to, joy to find, to compare, joy of giving meaning and direction, joy of understanding and of scaling the slopes and the summits of the true, the beautiful, and the useful. The mind orders it into clear, parallel lines and extracts the laws revealed within. Man feels then that he is master of all the elements, master of this disproportionate universe where his brain, no bigger than a bird or a fallen fruit, imposes a, comp a comprehensive order and harmony. Whoever does not know how to enjoy the possibilities of dreaming and thinking offered to man every second ignores the nobility of life. We can always be enchanted, for dreams are our secret cellos. One can always think, that is to say, having the mind not only occupied but vibrant, tending towards a domination more powerful, more exhilarating than the fire of a thousand desires. To be bored is to give up the dream and the spirit. Boredom is the disease of empty souls and brains. Life quickly becomes a horribly dull chore. Love itself is exalted and amazed only to the extent that the superior being nourishes the superior being nourishes poetry, strengthens the impulses of sensitivity. One must still dream and ponder over their love. 20. Patience. Patience is the first of victories, victory over oneself, over one's nerves, over one's weaknesses. As long as we have not acquired it, life is only a cascade of capitulations, capitulations made in struggle, certainly crying out in what we perceive to be manifestations of authority, but which are in fact only an abdication of petty, to petty pride. To be patient is to wait for one's hour, finger to the trigger as one watches for prey. It is to build each of the day's actions in consideration of order and balance, laying carefully he, the foundation stones that will support the building. Patience delivers the joy of not having given in. Impatience leaves the heart with the reproach of having been exiled and of having been the author of vanity and vain agitation. 21. Obedience. No great work is accomplished in selfishness and pride. Obeying is a joy because it is a form of gift, of clairvoyant gift. Obeying is fruitful, multiplying the results of efforts tenfold. Obeying is a duty because the common good depends on the dis disciplined coming together of many energies. Human society is not formed by a cloud of fierce and fanciful mosquitoes rushing in the wind according to their personal interest and their mood. It is a large sensitive complex, it is a large sensitive complex made sterile in made sterile or dangerous by anarchy, to which order and harmony give unlimited possibilities. A rich people of millions in population, but selfishly isolated and atomized, is a dead people. A poor people where everyone intelligently recognizes their limits and their communal obligations, obeys and works as a team, is a people with life. Obedience is the highest form of the use of freedom. It is a constant manifestation of authority, authority over oneself, the most difficult of all. No one is really capable of commanding others who is not first able to command himself, to tame in him the proud wanderer who would have liked to throw himself madly into the winds of adventure. After having obeyed, one may command, not as a brute, enjoying the right to crush others, but because command is a magnificent prerogative when it aims to discipline unruly forces, to lead them to the fullness of obedience, to the superior source of joy. 22. Kindness. 
Sometimes a word, a single word, an affectionate gesture, a look full of sincere friendship can save a man on the brink of the abyss. By affection and by example, we can do anything. Shouting and storming about real, rarely leads to the source of problems. You have to be good-hearted. Discover what is going on among the fog of each heart. Temper the necessary reproach with a friendly joke that gives hope. Always put yourself in the shoes of the other, in the soul of the other. Think of your personal reaction if you had received the observation, the encouragement, the reprimand, instead of addressing it to others. Most of the men are grown-ups, quite vicious but still sensitive, tense toward, tend towards affection. There are not 36 routes to guide them. There is only one, that of the heart. The other roads sometimes seem easier to take, but ultimately, they do not lead anywhere. 23. Happy Isolation The company of others is, most of the time, nothing but restlessness, noise, troubles revolving around mutual loneliness. To constantly search for what is called a stimulation is to be afraid of being in the presence of yourself. It is, in reality, to take flight morally. How can you confuse joy with being constantly mixed up in the tumultuous crowd? Why would one absolutely have to be swallowed up among other beings to believe oneself happy? One is then only in contact with the tree bark of others. One enjoys only their artificial or superficial attitudes. This can obviously give distraction, temporary pleasure, a kind of breath of wind or fresh air. But what a gulf between the, sh the shallow pleasure and the deep Essential joy of conversation with yourself, the analysis of one's own intimate thoughts and one's most secret sensitivity. There we see everything. We go to the source of everything. To deny the power, the magnitude of this true joy is to deny whole, the whole inner life. Loneliness is a wonderful opportunity for the soul to get to know itself and to keep watch, to learn. Only empty heads or fickle hearts are afraid of remaining silent in front of themselves. It is at such times that we see if our feelings are solid or if they were nothing but noise. High feelings can live alone, without physical presence. On the contrary, isolation purifies and grows them. The joy, the joy that spreads like a block of granite under the water of flowing life, the one that never gives up and which never disappoints, lies in the inner struggle, in the inner exultation, to watch over oneself, to dominate oneself, to purify oneself, to rise, to have the courage to think. Because it is so simple to be lazy or cowardly in the face of spiritual work. Have the energy to expand your inner, your hidden world, to love intensely, that is to say, to give oneself silently, without reluctance. We prefer to forget or deny that these fundamental joys exist to be satisfied with immediate enjoyments that we believe to be superior to everything, and after which we have nothing, very often, if not dust in the heart and a wilting of the wings. The mystics have long known that this constant animation of the interior life. Were they less happy? Did they have less joy that w than we who chatter? mingled with faces where we only discover appearances, fed by words that die with the echo. The joy of the mystics is just one example. The same inner joy exists at other stages of spirituality and sensitivity. The presence of others is not, is not even essential at all. One can perfectly love, be possessed by the highest joys of the heart in physical distance and even in death. As long as we have not once freed ourselves from, ex from external elements, as long as we have not been able to live alone, that is to say, in the most real company, that nothing can disturb, we have not yet reached a very threshold of joy. Instead of complaining about loneliness, you have to bless it. You have to take advantage of this unexpected possibility of examining yourself in silence and dominating yourself lucidly, completely, even in your most contradictory thoughts. Doors closed to the world, willful termination of the contract with outside of willful termination of contact with the outside, so much the better. Because it means, if you like, doors open to the soul, exact contact with oneself, exhilarating joys of knowledge, spiritual fulfillment, and mystically the most delicate and complete gift. And this is the last part. This is part um twenty twenty-four, grandeur. It is often by doing, this is the last part for, the, for this section here. It is often by doing with maximum nobility a thousand bothersome little things 
that you are great. It is infinitely more difficult to stretch your soul a thousand times every day without relief than to give a single grand impulse at the moment of a visionary event. Merit to be given there is slight. The magnitude of the fleeting opportunity alone gives us the strength to act and desire to the desire to astonish while allowing us to have the highest opinion of ourselves. You can do a great thing wonderfully and be far from real greatness. Greatness is the nobility of the soul wearing down, dripping with the desire to give, each according to our duties, especially when they are stripped of those things they, that give rise to vanity for both women and men. Greatness for a woman is often to give herself hour by hour to dull, even prosaic housework. Yet who will admire it? Who will know the thousand battles fought in the bottom of the heart, in laziness, in pride, in singing passions, in the softness which calls the soul and the body towards the warm sands of easy life? The one who, desp the one who despite all this advances, resists, pro progresses, progresses, is great since the gift of herself was total without requiring the vanity of recognition. So many high status people always complain, find everything unpleasant, never know how to rejoice, frankly, of nothing. Everything seems boring to them because they never give themselves up, because they approach each moment, even when it would require only a small exertion, with the firm intention of delivering only the bare minimum, and even with that reluctance. Everything is a question of giving freely. Happy people are those who give themselves. The dissatisfied are those who strangle their existence with a perpetual retraction, constantly wondering what they will lose. Virtue, greatness, happiness, everything revolves around that. Give yourself. Give yourself completely, all the time. Do what you have to do, bravely with maximum application, even if the object is merely housework, without apparent grandeur. Wherever you are, above or below, man or woman, the problem is exactly the same. It is giving that differentiates clear souls from troubled souls. And that's the end of that part. Yeah, it's essential. The monastic tradition, I mean, there's a lot there, I mean, to the monastic tradition, but, um, you know, the understanding that through silence and through introspection that's the way one comes to know god that's something that a lot of protestant congregations have gotten away from and that's really unfortunate um it's, there's nothing intrinsic to dissenter faith um um structures that 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 makes it axiomatic like if anything i think that you know the uh, the understanding the inner witness you find in calvin basically says you should that that's you know that's that's basically like the core of of uh of faith as 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 a practice but i i really enjoy being around like people i love and who love me back and you know enjoying um that kind of community we've developed among our peoples like it's fucking incredible you know like and i'm really really lucky but i i I don't just like being by myself a lot of the time. Like I need to be by myself because that's, you know, it's like your the mind is its own place, in ways that are both good and and bad. And like beyond bad, like that can be terrifying because it can create an environment that's either not livable or that has been compromised by, by, by by evil things. Um, and some of those things may be entities unto themselves i mean i that's a metaphysical question i don't want to get into on the tail end of our stream but um in any event a lot of that that's one of the ways that people are kept under control by officialdom you know uh is this inability of people to really be alone um and and to be alone properly i mean people are isolated but they don't know how to truly be alone you know that's why they're always seeking out no, that's why that's why social media is like their stand-in for um you know actual social life and things um it's like it, it, it was an inability of of people to be alone with their own mind you know and uh i'm always talking about you know my mind i think of it as an ice cathedral it's other things too but you know that's like the ice, the ice cathedral is where i would draw into myself and uh within it's 
proverbial walls. You know, I can I can go anywhere. You know, like I not not like actual projection in a literal sense, but you know, practically speaking, you know, I I I go all kinds of places in my mind, and it's not because you know I'm I'm some rarefied case. Um, you know that uh, I suppose that's what some people are up on if they say they're getting into meditation. You know, I mean, it's like okay, if people want to call it that, that's fine. I, I think I think there's some hokey stuff attached to those interpretations, but um, I'm not going to criticize anybody for you know for um, welcoming or cultivating an impulse in that direction. Like that's all I got for that. Um, I uh, that that was a really great reading, man. Thanks for including me. Yep, yep. Till the um, till part three. Yeah, man. All right. Let me get the screen shared here for section five. And I'm going to jump in, start talking. Um, stop me anytime, Thomas. I think you may uh, you may have some some comments on this section because um, this is part five of Man's Duty Notes from the Eastern Front. Yeah. Down the growl. 25, The Great Retreat. To die 20 years too early or 20 years too late is of no consequence. All that matters is to find a good death. Only with this goal in mind can we truly begin to live. As a simple soldier, I would gladly die tomorrow. The humility of my, life, of my lot in life at the front reconciled me such an outcome. Not having lived as a saint, to die as a soldier's soul would be the most suitable thing. Are my weeks numbered? Then it is best to make the most of these chances to purify our souls. I once dreamed of dying after a long illness to better prepare myself for the inevitable. But such a death necessarily takes place in an atmosphere of pollution. On the front, our preparation takes place in a feeling of power, in the unfolding of the will. I realize how lucky I am. Perhaps I return alive, more alive than ever before. Either way, this great retreat, which life or death will, will close, will have been a blessing. I enjoy it freely, fully, like a nourishing and beautiful sun. Why should I tremble under its fire? The soldier learns to be great among the most mundane or the most painful things. Heroism is to stand, to struggle, to be always alert, happy, and strong in nameless, unrecognized misery of the front, in the mud, the excrement, the corpses, the mist of the water and snow, the endless and colorless fields, the total absence of outer joy. Every day we move further away from the blissful world of yesteryear. Are we not already half dead, we who advance, gritting our teeth through the mists? Always look at those who have less than you and rejoice in what you have, never lusting after ephemeral desires. Life is always beautiful when you look at it with peaceful eyes, the light of a soul at peace. We soldiers, we have nothing and we are happy. The joy of an unencumbered soul can only flourish when one has cast off this jumble of mental slavery. War is not just combat. Above all, it is a long, sometimes exhausting streak, sometimes stretching into tedium of silent renouncements of daily sacrifices without relief. Virtue is forged in the same way everywhere. The privations endured with humility, waiting patiently for death's arrival, the giving of oneself, far from the spotlight, one plays one's part in an unknown field in unknown fields and groves in this wasteland far from all human joy. Such is the real war, the one waged by millions of men who will never know ostentatious, ostentatious glory and who, if they do not die, will return home with their faces tight, their lips closed, for others would not comprehend the heartbreaks and renunciations in their obscure heroism. The crowd is only struck by heroism when it is bright and loud. What impresses the public is the brilliance and not the painful and slow ascent of souls who rise in silence and shadow to greatness. But we... But are we ever understood? Do we hear? Do we see anything other than the superficial? The bottom of hearts is such an abyss of desires, denials, sorrows that we prefer not to approach it. It is simpler, more pleasant to stick to the superficial and without thinking too much to enjoy the words and attitudes that weave the tapestry of human drama. We, we soldiers, stand behind that tapestry. What souls will imagine our journeys? Who will have the strength to join us spiritually? Zeal, even intelligence, cannot be enough. 
To have culture is to have a balance of mind, illumination, wisdom, which can only be the result of a long discipline of the higher faculties, where the only proven method is the application of extensive contact with the most fundamental works of human intelligence. The disinterested study of ancient civilizations, mothers, mother, mothers of ideas and systems, the study of philosophy, the study of mathematics, the secret fabric of all the arts, the comparative study of the lessons of history, this alone can bring about the harmony of the human faculties, without which the most dazzling successes always have a character of miracle and fragility. Intellectual maturity is not irreconcilable with genius. Maturity makes genius exact and human, channeling it towards a desirable end. Its strength is not thereby diminished, only more useful. Richelieu would ha not have given France half of the blessings of his genius if he had been self-taught. The origin of our century's mental deb debilitation is that it is a century of the self-taught. Their work has, an, has a disorderly, inhuman, unstable character. True genius, or at least ben uh, beneficent genius, is balanced, which brings happiness, progress, and order. The instinctive genius is stunning, dazzling, but always at a great cost. When the fireworks fade, the sky only looks darker than before. The, bana the banal and the vulgar are neighbors of the grandiose and the eternal. Earlier, I watched a pig going to slaughter. He was keen on life, poor thing. Almost bloodless, still he gasped and moaned. Beasts and men, in the face of death, we are the same. Yet our honor demands, and we must take great care to ensure that at the hour of our death, we have the courage to face it with dignity. Soldiers, we risk our own skins all the time, and so we take very simple joy in merely existing. Death is always right before our face. Death is everywhere. Therefore, we understand the greatness of life better than others. If the soul did not rise, straight as the barrel of a gun, straight as the crosses over the graves, we would quickly sink into moral decay. Our whole world consists of woods, fields, marshes, strip trees, near which one is on the lookout, day or night, warming his hands with his breath, rubbing his ears, trampling over ground that is today as hard and unforgiving as granite, where just yesterday it was a sea of mud. In the evening, from four o'clock, we watch the shadows. We must guard our hearts closely so as not to weep in the face of such an abyss. The soul is faced with total surrender. And yet she is proud and she sings, because, stripped bare as in the bygone days of innocence, she is aware of the gravity of the mission offered to those who tread this lonely abyss, those who will redeem the cowardice and filth of a world peopled by empty souls. Here her wings start to beat again, shaking off the dried mud that once had dirtied them, they find joy again in the returns of clean air, open space, distant lines. If we here have made good of our suffering, we will have achieved our true victory. But will we, but will we who suffer be able to remain pure to the end? Won't we feel ridiculous in our angelic garb on our return? Will we have the courage not to be ashamed when we hear the countless jeers of those who have soiled their souls and who insolently believe themselves to be triumphant? Something uh, important, and you find this again and again in Waffen SS memoirs, and there's a peculiar irony, I think at least. You know, modern, modern infantry elements, the, the degree to which they owe not just, you know, um not just doctrinal things and um and tactical preferences to the Waffen SS, but the kind of organizational spirit and um the breaking down of barriers between officers and men, you know, that that all came from the Waffen SS. And that was specifically Paul Hauser, you know, um who's kind of like an unsung uh figure, um I think. Um not just because of his battlefield aptitude, but, you know, the kind of organizational model he had for the Vavin SS. It wasn't just a growl being some romantic and, like, you know, talking about, like, oh, the, you know, the, the, the glory that is, you know, to be the common soldier or the NCO, you know, leading the common man. Like, like, Vavin SS officers actually did lead from the front, you know, and, like, they ate with their men and, like, they, you know, there wasn't, um, I mean, uh, it wasn't just mission-oriented tactics. Um, 
you know, uh, and what we'd almost think of as the precursor to special operations in some cases, you know, particularly the case of, of people like Scorsini's commandos that kind of uh, created this sort of like egalitarian spirit, like that was very much cultivated, you know, and so it's corny as well as just, you know, a, a lie, you know, in, in these old movies or even in this kind of more contemporary stuff where they cast, you know, like the Wehrmacht or, or the, I mean, they cast the Waffen SS. And even the Wehrmacht, which still had these kinds of class-based issues, but not only to the same degree, but they cast like any German military force as this kind of like these like cruel, like Prussian martinet types, you know, like who have contempt for the men and like there's no recourse if you're uh if you're an enlisted man or an NCO, you know, against an officer, even if he's in the wrong. I mean, it's almost it's like a combination of like the worst of like the way the Soviet army was with you know, kind of a caricature of the 19th century Royal Navy or something. Like they, they could not be farther from the truth, you know. Um I point there's a reason why uh there's a reason why modern militaries like literally look like the Waffen SS too, from like the rifles they pack to their helmets, you know, to um to uh you know some of the ways uh they deployed, especially in the early Cold War, you know, as uh the distinction between um you know light medium and heavy light to medium and heavy armor was abolished. You know, they they can't be overstated and um that really comes out in DeGrell because he was obviously like a man of letters who had a, a, a certain, there's like a certain ash and lyricism in what he wrote. And finally, then we can move on. Right. You know, this this idea that like war is just horrible. Uh, the only reason I object to all quiet on the Western Front, not just because it's crybaby stuff, but it's just kind of at odds with, you know, the way humans are. Like if you're, a, if you're, a, if you're an infantryman at war, I've had guys relay to me that they're big terror, especially um, especially guys in Vietnam who were either flyers or on long range reconnaissance or in long range reconnaissance roles. There's a terror of being captured, which made sense, <clears throat> and there's an ongoing terror in the in the mind of every infantryman of <clears throat> infantryman of being of being wounded, particularly. And I mean, not not to be crass, but being wounded below the waist. Um, but you know, the worst thing that happens is you die. You don't have anything else to worry about. You're free, you know. Um, and uh, there's not any distinction between principle and action. And um, you know, the, the idea that this is some kind of like horrible hell to like be uh, serving the infantry in a modern war. Like compared to what? Compared to compared to working in like a mid 20th century factory? I mean, like or compared to working in a you know, compared to like having the life of Willie Loman as like a 1950s salesman, like it's there's something really at odds with reality about it. I mean, not just kind of like pussified and cowardly, although it's that too, but just like nakedly at odds with reality. Um, and uh, I think that that's important. Um, like a lot of <coughs> Yakim Piper didn't write any formal memoirs, but what he did put the paper about what it was like on the Eastern Front, you know, like he didn't romanticize it, like there, you know, he talked about how awful some of that kind of duty was i mean not just in what was called for in moral terms but like you know the physical brutalities that the modern infantryman had to put himself through i mean it, it, just, it certainly was not fun but it but it, it, it's profoundly misguided when people act like you know this was some like horrible fate you know to befall you as a man like to be a soldier at war that's all i want to do insinuate okay part 26 the taming of horses Fleas, king, fleas cling to our uniforms in serried ranks. Mice run all about. In the middle of the night, I awake to find a rat nestled against my nose. These companions strengthen us against vanity and pride. We who cannot escape even the smallest of beasts, the most ridiculous and the dirtiest. But poetry is everywhere. In front of our guns, thousands of sparrows jump in the hedges, round-bellied birds slowly dancing about. They listen a meter away to the little compliments that we offer them. Then they settle in wild flocks in the rushes. They cry, chirp, and hiss, as if the silver sky had thrown fistfuls of pure joy over the frosty landscape. There are also passing ravens, like black lightning, few and silent. From time to time, they utter their great hoarse cry, no doubt to remind us that death awaits us, harsh like them, ravenous like them, on dark and deadly wings. We strive to always smile at the singing sparrows, at the solemn crows that pass, but the heart is the heart, and every man, though smiling with his mouth and eyes, hides underneath the awful secrets of a suffering animal. 
We feel that death watches on every side. Each step exacts a cost. Our steps grow heavy and must be made light, despite the heavy guns, the stumbling feet, the fields of overripe grain that scratch the skin, the massive shell holes in which a misplaced step could drop one into the abyss without a word. This is it, the thankless life of a soldier, which knows neither exhilaration nor glory, where at any time one can be stabbed, shot, or dragged off as a prisoner by the enemy on the other side. You have to move forward calmly, meter by meter, even when shots may ring out suddenly from 10 paces away. Shots ring out in the night, between the outposts, a hoarse cry, and the night rolls on, impervious, frozen, relentless. At these times, our entire being wishes to rebel. We care for our lives, those of our comrades, the blood coursing powerfully through their veins. We are beings of the flesh. We want the light to be reborn. With vigor and heat, the human beast roars and cries out for his will to unfold, to burn, to resound. To remain huddled, subdued, to remain in the shadows, ready for the final act or take or the final breath, takes a terrible discipline. It inflicts terrible injury <clears throat> on our will. But our taste for life will be even stronger because we have more intensely experienced the value, the flavor, the burning sweetness of every second, falling like a drop of silence in this great tension of ready hearts. We love, with unchained power, our carnal existence, the rhythm of our thoughts, the momentum of our senses, which a single bullet in the night could shatter. Our arms, our legs, our eyes, to surround, to cross, to regard with passion and domination. All this screams man's right to life, the right of the animal that wants to run and seize, the right of the intelligence that wants to enchant and create. Life, how beautifully... How beautiful, indescribably beautiful, exhilarating, softness of body, light of midday, ardor of fire. We clench this life in our willful fists, those of silent, attentive, patient shadow watchers. We have learned to tame ourselves, to tame the wild horses which ran across the vast fields of our dreams. But holding them in our hands with a steel fist, we close our eyes and inhale the powerful smell of life that gathers above. Life. Life. It is so cold that the medicine vials shattered. The alcohol itself froze in the ambulance. Poor feet, poor ears, poor, poor frostbitten noses, mummified to, in the atrocious, howling, whistling night. This morning, the order to leave for another combat sector arrived. We will go where we are ordered, smiling in the snow, which since we awoke has been falling in heavy flakes. Our feet will be cold, our lips will be raw, our bodies huddled over against the cold will be heavy and awkward, but our inner fire will continue to rise and fill our eyes with glimmers of the sun. Here our souls are strained. These low hills, these rows of firs, these abandoned millstones watch us go, regarding our lines with shining eyes. This black sky that I contemplate now for the last time, I have filled it with the brilliant streaks of tracer bullets while the enemy's rounds uttered their shill cries, like pouncing cats all about me. Already my bag is ready. I look at the crushed straw, broken into smaller pieces on the spot I habitually rested after returning, tired and frozen, from late night patrols. The smoky little lantern casts a yellow light over my last daily report. A few more shirts, a few handkerchiefs, freshly washed, already covered with dust. Rough mud walls, the oven that we heated with debris from barracks, little frozen tiles painted with designs of white ferns. We picked up our battered bowls, our canteens, our weapons emblazoned with black lightning. No doubt to this place will one day return plants laden with fruit, Christian icons, a woman clad in heavy petticoats, and the thick smell of vegetable fat. But forever gone will be the humble and bustling life of many young foreign boys, lost in the depths of steppe, who, le who left in the middle of the night with calloused hands and frozen blood. This miserable, poorly lit square has been the center of an intense spiritual life. That life will leave with us and will be reborn at random from the frozen roads, improvised lodgings, embankments, and trenches from which we watch for and track down our opponents or avoid his blows. We may return to these spots one day, but the essential character will be gone. And so we leave at dawn without looking back. Life is ahead, even if life is death. Bah, the greater the sacrifice, the more we give of ourselves.
and it was to give of ourselves that we stood up with radiant hearts. Take a sip. 27, the apocalyptic cycle. The wind blows in biting gusts, whipping the snow against our skin like darts. The river is frozen, frozen, its little tributaries which ran through the crevices, frozen, the hills, the thistles of the embankments, the ruined factories. My heart itself is caught cold, cold from these months of soul tension, a withdrawal into inhuman solitude, cold as these rigid black trees which the north wind whips. Distress in everything. Everyone feels the chill. We break our cold bread. We scrape the huge chunks of mud from our clothes with a knife. We cut away great clumps of the blackish glue from our shoes and gaiters. No water. You have to go three kilometers to obtain a dirty brown liquid filled with grass clippings. Let us love our misery anyway, as it uplifts us, prepares us for destinies that call for pure and strong hearts. The cycle of wars is now apocalyptic. The waves widen more and more grow in speed and force to spread in a fabulous gyrating movement. Wars have become universal revolutions. The whole world is caught up in its whirlwind. Armies collide, economic forces clash. They tear each other apart. The forces of the spirit engage in a merciless duel. The universe will have to bleed, struggle, know the pangs of flight, the agony of separation. Thousands of men, millions of men will have to look with frozen or feverish eyes at death, always the same, that is to say, always cruel, tearing the heart at the same time as the flesh. This drama was inevitable. Only the blind and the foolish, that is to say, almost everyone, believed that these were conflicts of rival nations, conflicts which could be localized. However, these are implacable pseudo-religious wars, quite similar to all religious wars, but which will take almost limitless proportions, reaching up to the, little, to the last little island or ice flow so that all people, be they Tahitians or Laplanders, will have to choose like everyone else. When, how, will this prodigious settling of accounts end? Our skies will long be crossed by this lightning. Our children will grow up amid the blinding flashes of falling or triumphing ideas at arms. A century where the scale of the drama chills the blood, but a sorrowful century in which the whole universe is being reared more by spirit than by iron. Tragedy such as the world will never know. Uh, will, tragedy such as the world has never known so complete in which we are all actors, but where it is hearts that play. Millions of hearts are on the scene, still young and naive, or old and silent, or ruined and confused. To walk a hundred meters between the bloody lines, we come back broken, as if every step took all our strength. Nothing to do, nothing to read. We only have a miserable kerosene lamp with a small yellowish flame that lights up a square meter of our shelter. It takes more courage to live like this holed up in the mud than to advance on the enemy with the machine gun under your arm. You can feel the temptation, the muffled voices, the demoralizing questions. What are you doing here? Can't you see you're wasting your time? your efforts, your sacrifices? Does anyone even remember that you exist? Shall we leave you alone to rot away into oblivion? But the soul quickly regains its serenity. She knows that nothing is more precious than this renunciation, this silent descent into the depth of consciousness. Can the real victory, the victory over oneself, be better acquired elsewhere than in the midst of these humiliations, welcomed with the head held high by straightforwardly opposing this hostile environment the loneliness of the heart and the cunning of the enemy, which assault the spirit. 28 enlightenment war for us soldiers is to become among poor companions with grim faces, men huddled under the frozen earth defined by dark suffering without comfort. It is mud. It is a snow. It is bottomless despair. It is feet torn by the endless steps. It's the hundred shameful little miseries which surround the life of the soldier at the front, like a clinging and fog of sadness. The stifled life ceaselessly calls for the calling up of energy, the leap of the soul, which must tear itself out that mist in order to shine again. This life bears no resemblance to the brilliant ideas that the public has about the exploits of war, but they ought not to be disabused of this notion. We would thereby spoil their beautiful and brightly colored image. 
Yet I lie down in exhaustion at the end of each day with a joy that is a little bit sad, but powerful because it is an incomparable lesson in patience, self-mortification, the elevation of the soul. We should never try to cheat the ordeal of, or stifle its voice. If the lesson were to be useful, if we did not return as men changed by the experience, there would not be this wall between, on one hand, those who are afraid of the ordeal, and on the other hand, those who looked hardship in the eye and learned from it. Life sinks its fangs into us time after time. I escaped this time, like so many others, with a weary, worried, chewed up heart. I wish now to return there at peace, having found innocence in confidence. It is Christmas. I watch the snow fall tirelessly, and despite its lightness, I feel that I am suffocating. Soldiers pass, bent double against the wind, going quickly. Around me, nothing. Around me, nothing. Always the wind blowing, a man nervously biting his nails, others collapsing into sleep, exhausted by the nights on the watch. Jesus could have been born in our little shelter. Sincerity the good animals about the manger who offered themselves entirely. The honest hearts of the shepherds who did not doubt for a second, did not hesitate, and who immediately gave everything at their disposal. They only had sheep, and they gave their sheep. Who remembering them would not who remembering them would not take heart. What counts is not what you give sheep or great treasures. It is the fervor of the heart that weighs upon the scales. Sometimes life seems too exhausting to carry, painful even to think about. Today it is almost an anguish to forget your own existence, your screaming soul. What could let us forget? We have spent the day killing by the dozens the lice that chew at our skin. That is all. And yet the soul must stand tall, proud, steadfast. And it must stay that way. But great muffled voices deep in the background moan. We are not men differently built than the others. We too would like, when we listen only to the calls of that outer life, to do naught but pile up money earned without labor. All men desire this, whose bodies run hot, whose eyes are alight with the mixture of desire and pleasure. The human beast, youth, the need to dominate, rears up in distress. Are you not wasting your years of radiant life? Watched by death every hour, don't you have any regrets? Feel the desire to break everything and run, to throw yourself towards pleasure, towards luminous faces, towards beautiful women as the other boys of your time? These are times when you have to stifle your passions to feed your soul and your faith at the expense of such human desires that shine before our eyes like a mirage. We stand guard on icy parapets with a touch of bitterness in our hearts but supremely happy yet at the sacrifice renewed every day without even knowing if we will be ever if we will ever be understood end of the year i recap the line of dying days this year with its secrets and its illuminating lights the secrets that are hidden behind a smile but which often bleed like wounds never close and then the light light shone upon our character and our deeds there are the lights that we may show others. There, these, they are the least beautiful. These heroic, heroic lights we show to others, they maintain an air of theatricality and falseness, even when displayed in modest fashion. It is only with great difficulty that one can keep a truly naive heart and yet also take care to avoid an excess of pride. These lights, these imperfect lights, will remain superficial, but these glorious lights hurt our eyes. We are blinded when we leave them, and we are so often plunged from these brick lights into the shadows of everyday banality or minor setbacks. I remember those lights. I love them only to the extent that they illuminated that ideal towards which I walk. I should only like these lights for this reason, but I know very well that I have often let myself be taken in by my own self-satisfaction. Finally, these lights, necessary to rouse us to action, sadden me because they show me that over and over again, I find myself biting down on the hook of vanity or pride. And then there are the other lights, the ones that no one else sees from the outside. They light up our souls like x-rays. Then you know exactly what you are worth. Caught these lights, we are no longer very proud. We see ourselves, we see clearly all of our weaknesses. We see clearly the the excuses we have made for a hundred mistakes, always the same. 
but it is precisely because we know our own mediocrity all too well that we experience intoxicating joys when the lights that emerge from the depths of the soul end up illuminating a heroic work of our own doing. Though it be only a small act, it was born after so much secret cowardice that that first inner smile plunges us into unspeakable raptures. Twenty-nine, intransigence. Who kept us on their thoughts? The lost boys of the steppes, who had nothing to drink to the new year but melted snow, streaked with bits of yellow grass, or a few sips of artificial coffee that smelled of soap? Miserable details, humiliating details, the evo evocation of which seems out of place. Who else could imagine how the biting cold made a Herculean effort of even minor tasks? For example, the miserable, inevitable sickness of dysentery. Of course we had no sewers. 15, 20 times in just a few hours, you would have to run into the blizzard to re relieve yourself, allowing your body to be cut by a, by a wind as sharp as a blade, as sharp as a whip. Vanity of our bodies, in which we often took such pride. The beautiful human beast, strong, burning with life, must submit to these humiliations. The body rebels, but must give in. The body that was so satisfied with the pleasant rhythms of life, body which has been caressed, kissed, love, and we heap such shame upon you. Yet nothing can reach the mind that is master over itself. If the body is humiliated, it is because the will has led him into these whistling snows to the bottom of these sordid shelters. Yesterday it was lice, today the cold claws at our skin. We willed it to be so. We do not care that we are scourged by this hostile, ferocious situation. One day the cruel winds will die off with the return of the leaves to the trees. Our bodies, stretched out in the waters of the rivers, in the sun and in the winds, will feel life beating more ardently than ever around their bones. Strong as metal, under living flesh like the flesh of flowers, hard and clean like marble, but golden, full, vibrant. Having suffered in triumph, we will open our arms to the sun. And our smooth, powerful, and rough bodies will flow with blood like the sap of the great virgin trees. Our wills will bring back to, the, to life the beautiful human beast prancing with life, now tamed. The whole step ca caught up in the turmoil might well crackle, whistle, rise in gigantic waves. Despite the cold that scorched us, despite the gusts of hailstones that riddled our face, I faced the maelstrom a hundred times to fill my eyes with this grandeur. I felt carried away by the squalls, I communicated with this epic power where the white plain, the sky, and the wind mingled their strength, their leaps, their icy flames, their long cries springing from the horizon and howling away at the end of the quivering plain. What are, at such moments, the forces which rise up in us in communion with the great natural outbursts? I then feel transported. An immense bliss rises from all my body as a fabulous core correspondences were established between my blood which runs and the wind which blows, between the life which boils in my limbs and the savage life which blows past under the great sky. There is not one of us soldiers who does not have to be prepared for the most gruesome endings. But do we give only with reservation? Death and humiliation isn't a way of giving even... Death and humiliation isn't it a way of giving even more? True sacrifice cannot be calculated cannot be given with reservation. We listen to cynics more readily than to the message of righteous hearts, yet pure hearts will have victory. Only idealists will change the world. I am writing near a rusty barrel at the bottom of which floats the last bits of steppe grass suspended in our icy water. This poverty, this isolation, we know them because we desired sincerity. And more than ever, in this solitude where bodies and hearts feel invaded by mortal cold, I renew my odes of intransigence. More than ever, I will go straight ahead, without giving in, without rest, hard on my soul, hard on my desires, hard on my youth. I'd rather see 10 years of cold and abandonment than one day feeling my soul emptied, voided of its living dreams. I write these words without trembling, which nevertheless make me suffer. In the hour of our world's bankruptcy, souls are needed which may stand hard and tall as rocky cliffs, beaten in vain by raging winds. 30. The Cross. Which moment will be our end? 
Death Pass is unresponsive and his hands strangle hearts at random. The machine gun fires, it whizzes, it cracks, or it pierces with its deadly fingers a young man's body. What to do if not to have a pure heart, a quiet regard to the timely sacrifice made freely? If it comes, our eyelashes will not quiver, and we will leave with the faint, sad smile of the tender memories that surround our last seconds. If we come back, even though the warmth of life will have made us forget this icy breath, our hearts will forever have the composure of a life that has not trembled <clears throat> or death. May fate always find us strong and worthy. You still have to love happiness as you love the song of the wind, however fleeting it may be, as you love the colors of the evening, even though you know they are going to die. For the great winds are reborn and sing again, and every day the colors return to the blazing axis of the risen sun. It is up to us to keep the winds from dying or to prevent the sun from fading, but to draw strength from them while they, they yet live. Joy is the fire of indomitable heart of indomitable hearts, and no reversal can extinguish or stifle its burning colors. When you see the waves retreating from the sands, returning to the dark depths of the sea, think of the great outpouring that will return a few hours later, white, shimmering in the sun, bold and strong, as if these waves were the vanguard of an assault on the world itself. To be happy is to be unselfish. Happiness is just that, giving all of oneself. There are so many mediocre things on earth, low or ugly, that one day we would be overwhelmed by them if we did not carry them within ourselves, the fire which burns away ugliness, which consumes it and purifies us. Art is our inner salvation, our secret garden that constantly refreshes and soothes us. Poetry, painting, sculpture, music, anything but to escape from the mundane, to rise above the drying dust, to create something grand instead of submitting to the small, to let out that spark of the extraordinary that each of us possess and convert it into a grandiose, devouring, indistinguishable fire. The dead and dark centuries are those where souls hesitated before this effort. The luminous centuries are those which have seen the, these great fires of souls mark out, dominate the mountains of the spirit. The only true joys are not those that others give us, but those that we carry within us, that our faith creates, that fill us with dynamism. The rest comes from the foam of the sea, comes like the foam of the sea, shining at the tip of the waves, quivering for a moment on the edge of the sands, then quickly dies or withdraws with the waves. This is the happiness that others bring us from time to time. The joy that arises from our passion for life and our will is like the great force which rumbles and rolls at the bottom of the sea, which springs up to meet the sun and is renewed every second. As if hanging from a boat, we watch the mighty sea throw its waves like immense leopard skins, spread out, supple and shiny, standing up like a silver flame or like a prodigious spray of white flowers. This life, const this life constantly returns rebounds. We know that nothing until the end of the world will stop this momentum. So must be our hearts, brash, but like this wonderful rhythmic force, ordered, chanted like an eternal song. During the day, we are caught up in poor, often trivial concerns, but at night, the imagination weaves itself through our dreams, takes us into its, it takes us in its fantasies, its reconstruction or anticipation. Sometimes I'm amazed by the relentless lucidity of dreams. Of course, the dream is often a wild folly, a phantasm, but it is often also for me a meeting with my conscience and with my first intuitions. I see myself naturally as I am when my will is not there to lock its brakes upon the movement of my passions. I then know exactly on which points I doubt myself. Each time I must say to myself, look, here you falter. I thus have the almost daily proof that I can resist a thousand temptations, lead my life with honor only to it, the extent that a renewed effort masters and restrains every day, deep within myself, a wild horse, which can never be fully tamed and which only the whip of the will wielded unceasingly can contain. If the world were relaxed, everything would come undone. I see this in my dreams. Will the will itself fall asleep? I awake defeated. The dream has cut me adrift. There is no more decisive examination of conscience for me than the unfolding of dreams. Dreams lay bare my soul before me, 
leaves deep marks upon my thoughts with the knowledge that we must always be on guard over our baser impulses because these baser elements do not naturally run towards, but on the contrary, run from it as soon as they are tempted by beautiful falsehoods. The soul, freed by the gift it has made of itself, flies, soars, and sings. Because we hear within us these great songs of serenity, we know that the work we embark upon will be beautiful, for the great and the beautiful can only be created in joy and in faith. If we love virtue only insofar as it is taken notice of, we defile it with pride. We are no longer virtuous the moment we desire the virtue, which we believe we have achieved, to be seen and admired. So it is with all virtues. They are beautiful, soft, radiant if we love them for themselves, if we cultivate them for the unique pleasure of having reached them. We come to life without thinking or caring that we might not be understood by others. Uncomplicated hearts cannot imagine the complications of others. Fresh hearts cannot imagine other hearts being hateful or defiled. Suffering is the most wonderful of companions, pathetic and angelic, washing souls of all desire, raising them to the heights they had dreamed of for so long. Defeats, victories, dreams, or, mat or material successes pass away, are forgotten. Fires that shine for a moment, sense swept away by a passing wind. But the essential, the unique, is for us the great spiritual conflagration without the, which the world is nothing. So long as there remains a little fire in some corner of the world, all miracles of greatness remain possible. Everything in life is a matter of faith and tenacity. Trust cannot be begged for. It has to be won. And the best way to conquer it, to conquer, is to first give of yourself. We all carry our cross. We must carry it with a proud smile so that we know that we are stronger than suffering and also so that those who seek to harm us understand that their arrows reach us in vain. What does it matter if you suffer if you have what do, what does it matter if you suffer if you have had a few immortal hours in your life? At least we have lived. Got anything there? It's important, I think, to give particular attention to the fact that, you know, there's a basic dishonesty um, in the way warfare is discussed, um, not just in the abstract, but in the concrete experience of it, you know, by, um, by, uh, you know, by realist uh, types as well as, you know, neoliberals and, and what remains at least of, you know, Marxist types in academia who, you know, assign productive force determinism, you know, to their um, analysis of warfare and its causes and its, its systemic function and, you know, kind of sociological affairs at scale. You know, by the 20th century, um, wars of pure ideology which is what the grell's getting at when he talks about you know warfare itself being a revolutionary process and all warfare by the juncture at which you know he and his men took the field of battle you know being a, a a theological crusading enterprise that's that that's that's totally accurate you know um that's one of the reasons that it's bizarre when you hear American academic types, whether they're strategic forecasting types who've got, you know, their own kind of um, conceptual biases or whether they're just talking about kind of, you know, court historian types, they always come up short in, in describing warfare as a process or as like an ontological postulate. You know, they're always like grasping at some sort of um, at some sort of concrete variables, you know, be it of an economic nature or um, or they're, or, or they're, or they're falling back on, on, um, you know, the systemic remedies assigned by the, the system that they themselves serve, you know, and, uh, and, and, and kind of, you know, referring to warfare in terms of legalisms, you know, and, and, and bad actors and purportedly, you know, actors who are abiding what amounts to, um, you know, uh, a juristic moral precedent. I mean, this is this is incredibly misguided. Even if you eschew the fact that it's it's at odds with you know kind of the 
the human reality of it. Um, you know, nobody like World War II wasn't waged because um, you know the German Reich needed to capture markets to 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 you know needed to capture you know destination markets for for value added manufacturers. You know, and it was it wasn't waged because you know the, like the British wanted needed to guarantee that they could access their rubber plantations. You know, that were in Japan's backyard. Like that's not that's not um, reality. Um, and uh, I mean, and this endured throughout the Cold War, obviously, because the the the, the Cold War literally was a the conflict that determined, you know, what what world order would would be constituted of, you know, in terms of not just concrete structures that, you know, kind of determine uh, the, you know, human life and labors at scale, but also, you know, like what, what, what values for lack of a better term to invoke, um, would, would, would reign and what, and what kind of, what, what conceptual horizon would, would, uh, be triumphant over all others you know that's why um that's why america had such problems in vietnam because it it, it couldn't within within its own intellectual and moral paradigms like it couldn't it, it couldn't rationalize what it was doing because uh the war in vietnam was an ideological war as all, as all 20th century wars were and it was incidental that it took place in southeast asia it was incidental that you know the people it was waged against were were, were Asiatic, um, and uh, the logic of the body count wasn't just a performance metric of success. It was an end in itself because if you're going to eradicate communism, you've got to eradicate the standard bearers of it, and um, the standard bearers of any of any concept um, are human beings. You know, so you're talking about the eradication of human beings at scale in order to exterminate a concept and the ability of that concept um, to exist in the world, um, let alone constitute an enemy force to oppose you. Like you're talking, you're talking about the, you're talking about the slaughter of human beings, you know? Um, <clears throat> that's why too, people like um, another Frenchman, uh, Christian de la Manziri, I'm sure I'm butchering that pronunciation. You know, he wrote the book The Captive Dreamer, and he joined uh he joined the Waffen SS late in the game. Um, I think he didn't go into action until late 1944. You know, he fought with Charlemagne. Um, who were incidentally the among the last defenders of uh of Berlin. But, you know, in this book he made that point that it was, you know, he he um it we when it was clear that Europe was going down, you know, he's like I, I wasn't, I, I wasn't going to not participate in, you know, in in the crusade to save it from, you know, it's 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 ideological and racial enemies, and that um, <coughs> that that's um, you know, that's very much a crusader spirit, and um, that's really the only spirit that that can animate people at scale towards a modern war in in um in turn at least in terms of the stakes that were on the table for the for the germans and for the russians you know um it's a little more complicated when you deal with america insinuating itself into these like wars of choice but that that's kind of a different thing i mean that's that's born it's born of a i mean of a purely ideological imperative as well but there's there's a a complexity there that um is the subject for a different discussion but um no, that's all I had. That's all I had to contribute right now. All right. The final part, part six, to give completely. Part 31, the reconquest. The turmoil that agitates public opinion, the wars that shake up nations are just episodes. Partial reforms will do away with such periodic chaos. To attempt to change people would be a very disappointing work if it were if it were not accompanied by the essential work of changing that which lies deep in the soul by a transformation of the very foundations of our times. All the scandals, the decline of honesty and honor, shamelessness in the, cert in the certainty of impunity, 
the passion for money which sweeps away conventions, dignity, self-respect, and morality, which has become unconscious, uh, unconscious indicate the existence of a deep-seated evil which calls for remedies of equal magnitude. It is not suddenly that we lie, that we break all moral laws, supernatural or natural, and more simply, the laws of the public code. It is not overnight that you work yourself up to bold hypocrisy, to speak truth only with reticence, to lie with virtuous words. This deformation of consciousness, which amazes, which frightens today, or which puts on an air of sarcastic superiority, is the only conclusion of a long decline in human virtues. It is the passion for wealth, the will to be powerful no matter what. It is the frenzy to be honored. It is materialism. It is the unscrupulous gratification of instincts which have corrupted men and through men institutions. The world is more and more preoccupied with banal, material, or simply animal joys. It maintains itself only by the principle of maximizing material wealth. Each man lives only for himself and allows the domination of life both within his own home and within the country by a constant egoism which has converted men into hateful, embittered, greedy wolves or corrupt and soulless half-men. We will come out of this downfall only through an immense moral recovery by reteaching men to love, to sacrifice themselves, to live, to struggle, and to die for a higher ideal. In a century when we live only for ourselves, it will take hundreds, thousands of men to live no longer for themselves, but for a collective ideal, accepting in advance all the sacrifices, all the humiliations, all necessary heroism. All that matters is faith, brilliant confidence, the complete absence of selfishness and individualism, the pulling of the whole being towards service without promise of reward in any place by any means toward a cause that goes beyond man, asking him everything, promising him nothing. The only things that count are the quality of the soul, the, pul the pulse, the total gift, the will to hoist an ideal above all else in the most absolute selflessness. The time is coming when saving the world will require this handful of heroes and saints to make the great reconquest. 32, Flotilla of Souls. Nations recover rapidly from financial setbacks. They may reconstitute without too much difficulty a new political framework. All that is needed is skilled technicians and a willingness to work together. Great revolutions are not political or economic. They are small revolutions, changes of purely mechanical nature. When the specialists put the pieces together, when the engines have found their rhythm and stern-faced foremen have been set to watch over them, the material revolution is accomplished. The rest will only require repairs from time to time, a modification here and there. The machine is fitted or overhauled. The gears turn, most of the work is done. The real revolution is far more complicated, one which brings together not the machinery of the state, but the secret life of every soul. There it, there it is no longer a matter of automatic review and monitoring. It is about the vices and the virtues, the impulses towards profundity and weaknesses, the desperate hopes that are so dear to us. What is there at the bottom of that gaze, behind those eyes that remained on us for a long moment, as if great secrets lie upon our eyelids? A hidden heart, a soul, its secret crises, its outbursts, its despairs, the desire of the body and its indelible decline, the sorrows that are so difficult to hide or guess at, the uncertain and troubled struggle towards happiness is the great drama of man. But there too is the real revolution, bringing light to spirits caught in the shadows to aid in the restoration of failing souls, to relearn that we consist of more than just a body, to perfect the imperfect, to rise to heights of virtue, no matter how great are the efforts required of us. The revolution alone can be enchanting, but terrifying. We all walk through a labyrinth. That thin bowed head and that beautiful golden hair, that Laughter that bursts too suddenly, that arm that descends, ten faces, ten abysses. Who cheats us? Who is mistaken? Who seeks to deceive us? 
we only see the deceptive shadows of beings. Everyone tries to deceive themselves, to deceive others, by simplifications and by more or less skillful artifices. And it is among these subterfuges, however, that we must advance our flames burning white in the darkest night. What is there to take hold of? What can we do about the, these beings who are too who to our impotent eyes appear only mysteries, mysteries all the more poignant as we observe their laughter, vivacious eyes, pale foreheads, this, this soft caress of flowing hair, which with joyful light oppose all our regrets, anguish, weariness, and corruptions. We all make our way along distant paths. The bottoms of our hearts alone know our true face, the false secrets of our soul, its hopes and faults, our true joys and our true sorrows. There were so many joys and so many tears that the others thought they knew, shared, and assu assuaged. We look in the hours of solitude at our real selves where no one else, alas, could ever go. This inner self tells us who he loves and to whom he belongs, what overwhelms him and causes him to stumble, and tells us what raises up his spirit, perhaps if by fortune the breath of truth brushes aside the invisible veil. To be this current, this great warm and long wind which rises from the depths of our spiritual horizons, which gives souls this first movement. All of a sudden the sail undergoes an impalpable swelling, rounding off in the light. The hull slips across still waters. The inflection of the white sails gently pushes the air away. We think of those thousands of motionless sails waiting for what will give them, imperceptibly at first, then with quivering force, life and movement, the joy of moving through air and water, advancing through the clear line of the horizon in the distance. The boats are heavy. The water is dark and sluggish. Everything is silent. Be this breath that will come at last to rouse these souls, to push them off, clumsy at first, left after so much waiting and stagnation, then happy and firm as the strength that sustains them and the life that revives them is confirmed, show all these beings that existence can be beautiful and pure and great, even after all the weaknesses and all the disenchantments, to bring up from these dry or numb or perverted hearts the fountain of renewal. This is the task, the real one, the hard one, the necessary task, terrible task. We would like to take these half-dead people in our arms, look deeply into their eyes, ward off these creeping doubts and hesitations to run our trembling fingers through their silken hair. But what a stir upon meeting those eyes which return the light of others, those eyes which show us so quickly from their first lie or their first confession, the confusion that inhibits us ourselves. How to look at a face without hearing cruel questions. Are you lying? How shall you fare under fire, under privations of the flesh? And what will remain tomorrow of the hopes and aspirations painfully suspended, buoyed by this gaze? The source of all redemption lies there, however, to give life to drifting souls, to calm the storms which break their mass and tear their sa sails, to give them sun and breath, to make serene the seas of men, to make their horizon clear, free from the shadows and perils of violent and tormented skies. Breathe. Resume believing in virtues, in beauty, in goodness, in love. Feel dancing around you on the waves, a thousand other sails, full of wind, carried with the same momentum towards the same call. When the golden sea, when the golden sea sees these white sails rush forth, the revolution will be on its way, carried onwards by this flotilla of souls. 33. Summits. Your road is hard. You come short of breath. There are times when you would like to throw away this burden that weighs you down. Let yourself go downhill and return to the, those idyllic farms that welcome you back at the bottom of the hill, blue streams against the green and gray backgrounds of meadows and slate roofs. You feel nostalgic for the quiet waters and the clear rushes, the ore that laps against the surface, the flat, effortless path along the banks. We would like to think of nothing, wash away the memories of men from your thoughts, and, with your back against the grass, watch the passing sky, lightened by flocks of birds. No more weariness. You won't let go of your bag and your stick. You won't attend to your bent, bleeding knees. You won't listen to the clamor of hatred. You won't look at the smiling eyes and the wickedness they hide. It is to, it is to the summit that you must cast your eyes. Your body should live only for these twisting paths. 
Your heart should dream only of these heights that you and the others should reach. What lies at the root of your what lies at the root of your confusion? You thought you would find immediate joys in climbing this path along the sea and raising this human host. You have often suffered. Sometimes you feel nauseous, yet you needed it. You had to learn that ambition does not pay off, that sooner or later it tires out the heart it possesses. You know it now. You know that you should not expect any constant joy from outside. You have learned to doubt the comfort of men. Your face is flushed, not from the tenderness they gave you, but from the blows that you were dealt by them. Of course, you did not think it would. You imagined that along the road, your hands and eyes would find what you so feverishly desired. You look back and you say, I am going back down. No, it is only then that life becomes noble when it beats you down, when you no longer have the enthusiasm to carry on. Do you remember the early days? You wanted a very beautiful climb, it is true. You were leaving this way to free your soul. You knew that, that man must always overcome his limitations. Didn't you believe in this obscure pleasure of honor and discipline? Are you crying out? You did not think for it to be like this. You rejected comfort with sincere enough words, but it still hemmed the edges of your actions as the foam borders the edge of the sea. You honestly thought that you only lived for this thread of light, beautiful only from afar on the edge of the sands. The temptation was there in your heart. You wanted something grand, something real, but you still had the thought of yourself near you. You announced your readiness to do your duty, but you made the silent addition that to fulfill your duty would bring glory to your name and satisfy your own desires, would make you golden with pride. It's because you don't see this phantasm before you anymore that your eyes reflect only shadows. You are looking in the dark. Confront it, the fact that you loved something false. Those who have disgusted, those who have disgusted you a hundred times with their wickedness and injustice have carried you more than your own strength. Are you giving up? You give your flesh and your breath, your heart and your mind, and you think now it is all in vain? In vain? Why? Because you no longer give them in service in your selfish pride? Only now can you start to give of yourself. That wickedness had to overwhelm you. By the time you were almost fainting, at the end of your effort, the jeers would rise and contempt would drive you on. It was necessary that all your gesture, gestures of love be covered with hatred, that all your impulses be soiled, that each throbbing of your heart command a new blow to fall upon your face. You have known so many times those exhausting last few meters where you smiled on the threshold of the gold despite your sweat and your pallor. The next moment you were falling among the rocks, betrayed by your own, overwhelmed by the others. Everything had to be redone. And always the charming emptiness of the valley below hailed you. The trembling poplars called you like a line of ships on the sea of easy days. You suffered from the harshness of the fighting. You said to yourself, whatever the victory, the price is too expensive and I no longer desire it. You always thought of yourself, yes, for you, for the human pleasure of having reached the top, you made a fool's bargain. But if life had not slapped you a hundred times, would you ever have understood that there are other pleasures than pride, than smiles, than glory? You have felt the hypocrisy of so many faces around you. You have guessed all the lies, all the gall, all the meanness that is in store for you every time you start climbing again. You are no longer entitled to anything. You hear the swarm of slithering horrors. You know you will go through with the objection and with the abjection anyway. It is at the it is at the hour when you have given everything that you will be said to be greedy. It is at the hour when your heart will suffer the most abandonment that it will be given the basest of demands. You turn around with tears that well up in spite of you. Why? Are you still thinking of yourself? Do you still suffer from injustice? Is it all about you? How hard is it to be free from our humanity? Let them come crashing down on your life like jackals. Let them trample your dreams. Let them open your heart to all the winds. Suffer from being thrown to the beasts of envy, cal calumny, baseness. Endure above all, and this is what bruises the most, that at the moment when you cannot take it any longer, when your knees bend, when your eyes cast about for a supportive look, your arms search for an ardent hand, support, while you are hanging on a word, a look, 
that this word falls down to break you, that look to hurt you, except that it is those who are closest to you who finish you off, those to whom you had left everything, whom you love so naively, without reserve and without hesitation. Your eyes have a bewilderment worse than tears. Do not cry out. Expect that everything you suffered yesterday, tomorrow will be renewed. Accept this in advance. Do not even turn around when you hear that step behind you. Bless the blows received. Love those who will bring them. They are more useful to you than a thousand hearts that love you. Did you get it? You may find tomorrow, or perhaps you may have found already, that tenderness that comes to you like a breath of fresh air or like the scent of a cluster of country flowers. You are now without weakness in front of them. You will only enjoy dignity to the extent that, by dense of suffering, you have learned to do without it. This you would never have obtained had you not paid the price a hundred times, hundreds of times, without ever being sure of receiving anything in return. If one day this appears to you, enjoy it as a sublime landscape glimpsed in passing. But it is not for this that you came. It is the air. It is the light of the summits calling you. You are breathing better already. You will slowly attain true joy at those great peaks of consciousness, shining, unsullied. Think only of this, see only this, try to get there, light, pure, radiant with sunlight. It is your weaknesses and your faults on which you should weigh, on them alone, your pride, your name, the vain appeals of the departing men, throw them beyond the rocks. Did you hear them break as they bounce down the slope? May it all perish. May bitterness and abandonment, instead of rebellion, keep you on the path. These two howling dogs are the guardians of the herd of your thoughts. Without them, you would stop. You would pull away. Do not waste a moment. It is far, and you must reach the summit. When you reach these pure immensities, behind you will be a great silence. All those who screamed after you, who hated or trampled you despite the smiles on their faces, all those who, just to strike at you, followed you on the road, will suddenly realize that at this game they have, they too have reached the snows, the new air, and the horizons cut out in the sky. They will forget to hate you. They will have wonderfully childish eyes. They will discover the essential. Their souls will have been lifted to heights they would never have agreed to reach if your back that had received their blows had not hidden the length of the road. So you will have it, your victory. You will be able, having given the final effort, suddenly to fall, arms outstretched from the top of the mountain into the rocks below. You will be done. You will have won. Reaching the end of your own journey by the last effort will no longer matter if the others are there on the brink of the, of the pure immensities of redemption. You are so happy deep down. You know the only happiness is there. Sing. May your voice thunder in the valleys. Regrets and tears. The most unremarkable man among you has suffered this, and you would reject him? The hardest thing is done. Hold on. Clench your teeth. Silence your heart. Think only of the top. Go up. Um, that is the message from Mr. DeGrell. Yeah, it's, it's quite, it's a, it's, there's a positive tendency I've discerned. There's a lot more people taking an interest in, um, not just revisionist topics, but you know, real testimony of of um, officers and men who who fought for the German Reich and, and uh, um, affiliated adjacent forces. It's not unlike um, the kind of renaissance of lost cause historians in the 1980s who uh, that's when Shelby Foote became really kind of popular. That's also when The Killer Angels um, became this beloved book. And um, kind of the tail end of that was when, um, you know, The Killer Angels was made into Gettysburg, which people have mixed feelings about that movie. But, you know, the very early 90s was kind of the, the end of that sort of tendency. 
um, both in, in, in war academia as well as in kind of pop culture. But um, obviously the, that's got profound implications that something similar is underway um, vis-a-vis the German Reich and the experience of World War II. And um, that, I mean, that's very exciting and that's very much a corrective because it's not, this, this stuff directly impacts the structure of the world we live in, you know, conceptually, um, physically, you know, every, every way you can imagine. Um, so the fact that, the fact that, um, you know, it's, it's no longer got the ability to kind of fascinate the public imagination to the point that, you know, not only are revisionist perspectives crowded out, but that it's unthinkable, you know, on, in, as regards the prevailing morality for, you know, any, on any, counter, any countervailing narrative is going to enter public spaces, discursively speaking, is, there was a sea change, but it's very exciting. So, yeah, I think it's important to um, make people aware of stuff like the Grell's memoir, because, again, too, the Grell was obviously like a man of letters and very much you know, like a cultured European type. And, you know, that's, um, people, have, even people who are sympathetic to the, to the Axis cause in history. They've got a sense of the, they got, they got a sense of, of the Germans as being possessed of a certain kind of rigidity in their cultural output, um, which is not entirely fair, but I understand why they think that, but yeah, that was great, man. Yeah. The, um, what it really makes me think is that, those people who are waking up to it um, and who are genuinely seeking the kind of enlightenment that someone like Mr. DeGrell had, um, they really need to put aside their pet causes, especially if their pet causes are divisive. You know, within... Yeah, 100%. Well, it's also, too, like these people... They're not, um, you know, like where the rubber meets the road. Um, people like the grill are their their uh, their ethical commitments as well as their aesthetic ones were informed uh, <clears throat> very much by idealism, but it's through a filter of concrete political realities. And like most of these, like most of these guys, most of these guys who are the most kind of stalwart proponents of these div- divisive pet ideologies. Like it's they're they're creatures who exist only in the internet. Like there's there's nothing remotely concrete about their shit, you know. Um, and that's one of the reasons why they're so inflexible because it's it's never um it's never been challenged by you know the the nuances of 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 war and peace questions. And when I say war and peace questions, I mean things that impact anybody of a partisan mindset, even in day-to-day life, you know, like there's a spectrum of war and peace of, you know, on the, the most extreme ends are, you know, hostis and anemicus and on the other end is, you know, a, a splendid peace where within the common political space, only friends, capital F exists. But, you know, there's a, a there's, there's a infinite gradations between one side of the, spectrum and the other so um you know you're very much you're very much at war um in metaphysical and unfortunately sometimes concrete terms although i certainly don't advocate anybody to undertake violence other than in defense themselves their property or their loved ones but um you know um people are people are closer to these processes um in a very sanguinary sense than they realize um, if they're truly engaged and not just, you know, somebody playing a game, you know, from some anonymous and remote um, location. But yeah, that's, uh, that's very good, man. Um, well, before I have you do your plugs and everything, um, I, we have to thank um, the, I don't believe this was ever translated into English before Antelope Hill did it. So um, we have yeah, to- they're a great publishing house. Uh, I, I'm on their mailing list, and they 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 
release great stuff, man. I can't recommend them enough. Yep. All right. Do your plugs. And um, once again, thank you for joining me for uh, a thousand episodes. <laughs> yeah. No, it's great. Um, yeah. I, you can always find me at thomas777.com. That's the one stop location for links to all my content. It's number seven, hmas777.com. Substack is going to continue to be my primary home for podcast content as well as longer form content and i'm debating releasing the third um book in my science fiction series exclusively on on substack now and like you know to subscribers like chapter by chapter i haven't decided yet but um because i won my war with stripe um in, in their effort to deplatform me for the time being um we're going to remain on substack I'm probably also going to set up a Gumroad account, too, for, among other things, like a repository for video content, which I'm actively shooting. Um, but that's that's new to me, so thanks for bearing with me. I mean, I've not, I mean, everybody who subscribes. Um, but uh, you can always find me at Substack at realthomas777.substack.com. I'm on Instagram as well. Um, you can link through um, my website, um, and I'm on X at uh, real capital R E A L underscore number seven H M A S seven 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 dot com. That's where we're at right now. Um, I'll be announcing some of these changes. I mean, I have been, and will continue to announce some of these changes on my Substack. Um, things are kind of normalizing, and I've got my workflow locked in now, thanks to our dear friend Jay Burden, as well as some of the people you plugged me with. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to report that, you know, um, I'll finally be up on, you know, fresh content every 14 days again, as was, as was the case uh, for most of last year. That's all I got. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this with me. Yeah, man. I appreciate Good it. Time. And um, yeah, just a little tease, um, Thomas and I, before we started recording this, started talking about the next series. And I think that would be a, uh, It'll be, it's going to be of great interest to a lot of people. A lot of, I think a lot of people have already commented that, yeah, we'd like to see, uh, like to, like to see that conversation, uh, that subject covered. But let's not tell them what it is and just. No, I'm, I'm very excited, and yeah, I appreciate the the guy who suggested it very much. Um, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I'm very excited, man. All right, thanks, man. Yeah, likewise.